see. Obviously, TNC come into this looking as the fa looking like the favorites. They're opening up with a Mars plus Hoodwing combo too. That's the old reliable, right? In case of emergency, break glass. Get yourself a nasty double hero combo that just wins the lane pretty much every time. And LBZS, yes, they pick up some very old, reliable heroes themselves in the form of a Marcy and a Pangolier. So it's a pretty decent opener for their part. They still feel a little bit on the reciprocating end here. Like, if TNC open a draft with a Mars and a Hoodwink, you know it's really. likely going to be good. I mean, TNC, they may just be underestimating LBZS a little bit remaining. by trying to draft together something cookie-cutter here, but I doubt it's going to be anything boring. Bloodseeker and Face oh, Void getting see. bad out. To make sure that two of TNC's strongest heroes just aren't at their disposal at all here. That makes a lot of sense since, yeah. The stuff Bloodseeker is capable of in the current patch has made him one of the top bands, and it's honestly quite justifiable. Like, once he goes off, remaining. he really goes off. Five seconds remaining. Dire team ban. Monkey King, another scary core hero that is getting the bad hammer here. Makes a lot of sense too, since, you know, Monkey King, great synergy with the Mars. If you hit a great arena and you have a Monkey King ultimate available, that can be a team wipe. Obviously, it's usually not going to be a team wipe, but just a one fight right off the bat. But it's a lot easier to simply not have to deal with that Monkey King ultimate. It's not like there is anything LBZS themselves are particularly weak against playing against it. So they're just gonna ban out whatever would make TNC Predators Draft come together really well here. Radiant Team Pick. <laughs> Okay, TNC Predator got a lich number as pick number three. Great synergy with that bushwhack. As a hoodwink, if you set up those lich ultimates, those things are going to hurt hard. Also, lich is a great defensive support. Those frost shields enable you to pretty much always, well, if you don't win the lane, at least not lose it really hard. Like, it's a great hero at salvaging a really hard lane, even if you get a bad matchup, Radiant even if you get countered. Pick. And with the... With LBZS picking two heroes in a row here, and TNC having the very last pick of the draft, it makes a lot of sense to be ready for everything here. Lina and Winter Wyvern getting revealed. I love the Winter Wyvern here. I think it's going to be a really good Winter Wyvern game, because even with just the heroes currently present, TNC Predator, they rely a lot on their positioning. They rely a lot on being ready to respond to one another in rapid succession. Like when there's remaining. a spear, you want to obviously follow that up with a bushwhack. When you hit a bushwhack, you want to follow that up with the lich ultimate. And oh, we are in for a treat. That's an invoker revealed. TNC Predator. They have so much team fight, so many huge spells to just unleash on their enemies. But all of these huge spells can backfire real easily with stuff like the BKB, like a pipe being picked up. This draft is like at least 80% magical damage so far. I think the last pick is going to be a real greedy physical right clicker. Yeah, LBCS yes, seem to agree with me. They get rid of the troll warlord. Another hero I feel like should really be on the chopping block here, especially with the wind wyvern being picked up by LBCS, should be that Slark. I don't think Slark should get through this draft. Slark would be amazing for TNC. Slark plus Lich is great. Slark plus Hoodwink is another pretty good combo. Then you get that Alacrity from the Invoker. And it counters the Winter Wyvern really well. It deals with the Pangolier. You got an answer to the Rolling Thunder. You almost always got a guaranteed getaway. A get out of jail free card.
Radiant team ban. Razor getting banned out now by the side of TNC themselves. And that makes a lot of sense for the side of LBZS to pick up something along the lines of a Razor. I still think the Slark for TNC is looking really, really juicy here. Ten seconds I don't think LBZF, LBZS draft got what it takes to shut Five down a hero like the remaining. Slark right now, or any other of the escapable hyper carries. But I think of those, Slark is just one of the most entertaining to watch and one of the heroes that has had an excellent performance over the last couple of games. Dire team ban. All right, it's gonna be a Templar assassin banned out here. Radiant Over team something like the Slark, TNC Predator, Phantom they ban assassin. out the Patch and they immediately get Phantom Assassin. That's something I kind of saw coming. I was gonna say it's either the PA or something along the lines. There's another bunch of really good melee carries in the draft that get often overlooked. Something remaining. like the Lifestealer would have been really effective against TNC too. I feel like Five this PA is so hyper-reliant on a BKB now. You really need to hit your item timing on that. You really need to make sure you take fights only when the BKB charge is ready. And yeah, there it is. That was real freaking obvious. It's one of my favorite heroes. I'm always happy when I see that Slark coming out. But I do feel like LBCS are insufficiently prepared to get slarked on right now. We're going to see if they find a way to deal with it. But this is Asta Slark. I don't think there is a way to deal with this, honestly. All right, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are waiting to load in. How do you counter this TNC draft? How do you play against this? Is what I'm asking myself. Because the Winter Wyvern ultimates, I mentioned them being really good. They stay really good with the Chris Invoker and Asta Slark. Like those two heroes, they don't particularly counter the Winter Wyvern ultimates on their own. They are still going to be super susceptible to being shut down. And that forces Slark to get that early Aghanim Scepter. We do see Aghanim Scepter on Slark picked up almost every time the hero is picked. But whether you get it early or a little bit later is the, what the main debate is about, right? When do you get your Aghanim Scepter on the Slark? And this is one of those games, you need it early. You need to be able to just not stand with your team from the very moment PA gets her BKB. Hell, if Slark gets online before that timing with an Aghanim and everything at his disposal, then I think some of those Winter Wyvern plays may just end up being super lackluster. I most certainly psyched for the first draft of the day, and we got a pause. Great. The juicier the draft, the more likely we are to be stuck pausing when we load in, I swear. Alright, so... The uh, TNC Predator, they do have to fix their VPN real quick to be able to connect to the China server. Hopefully it should just take a second, and, you know, there are a couple of really good loadouts to look at. I really love the Phantom Assassin. I think it looks amazing with the Immortal and everything. Got the Arcana going on too. And then there's still people who think the Persona is superior. Like, no. Look at what fat loadouts you can make off the back of that Arcana. There's some really sick PA stuff in there. And don't get me wrong, I don't mind the Arcana as much, uh, the Persona as much as most people do. Like, a lot of people I'd, I just saw on Twitter were really salty about the PA Persona. And I, I kind of get it. Because when I saw the PA Persona first revealed, I was like, okay, this is gonna be Void Spirit before he died, right? Because all the spirits they used to live once, and it looks like Void Spirit. Same type of weapon, same time, but same type of aesthetic going on. I thought it was a freaking Void Spirit persona, and I was so psyched for it. And then it turns out to be PA, so I really see why people are pissed. It just doesn't fit the hero, right?
Я тебя I не слышу. Партида тенса. Партида тенса. Партида компликада. Asta spamming out those voices. I think he's really happy with the slark game he's got on his hands. If I had to say who the superior draft is, I would definitely go with TNC Predator. It's harder to execute, but on paper, they just have such an easy time ahead of themselves. I don't see how you shut down the slark. If they do so, shut down the slark, then all of a sudden TNC Predator becomes really easy to play against. So... It's mostly dealing with that really nasty position 1 hyper carry who's gonna steal all of your agility both temporarily and permanently so. And it looks like Asta, he himself got that Echo Saber queued up so it's gonna be a bit of a blast from the past. We're gonna see the retro build getting executed here by the Slark. And yeah, somebody in chat says Slark pick auto win. I feel that for games like this. In drafts like this, it's actually just busted and slark is so nasty i think there is a lot of good ways you can answer the slark you can deal with him heroes like pa they can definitely have a matchup against him i just don't think lvc has got enough lockdown in this particular case we're gonna see though maybe you know why chen can once he gets the laguna blade use that to insta kill off the slark and a zero minute smoke coming out from cnc predator so, zero minute smokes, they aren't as good in the current patch as they used to be. Last big patch, whenever you smoke out of the base, it would always secure you a huge edge. Nowadays, very few teams do it. It can still lead to some very nice setups, some very interesting first bloods for one. And with this smoke, they are gonna go for this bottom lane wraparound play. Sinful soul. Yeah, you do not want to be here, my friend. <laughs> no first blood action just yet. We're just waiting for the runes to spawn and see whether or not Sinful Soul is gonna accidentally step out of position or not they would really want to go for the first blood but sinful soul he seems to know something's up he just goes back says all right guys i'm not gonna risk giving away the first blood for a rune and yeah asta just laughs his ass off walks away to do his own thing so the runes obviously split 50-50. Everybody is gonna head for their respective lanes. And yeah, it's LWW <laughs> playing the Winter Wyvern as a position 5. I wasn't quite certain on whether or not they were gonna go for this Pangolier plus Marcy lane. It has high kill potential though. Like, if Salad is able to jump people with the Marcy, get them stuck out of position. Yeah, look at this. Mavis, he just loses half his health for peeking at the Marcy ones. That's another reason why I think Stark is so good here. With the attribute steal, you're able to man up against one of the highest kill potential lanes currently available in Dota. And the other really high kill potential lane that people really love to play a lot. Well, that's what we got going on on the bottom lane already for TNC Predator. So this top matchup i think it's about a 50 50. <laughs> if lbzs keeps playing like this keeps dragging the waves between the tower and manipulating the creep aggression then lbzs could actually come out ahead against the slark lane which needless to say is a very impressive feat in the current patch i love me some slark i think he's such an interesting hero to watch but he is kind of busted nowadays and if he's just able to free farm for a good 15 minutes or something and slark starts running you down that's the moment where you know the game is just gonna be lost at that raid and there isn't really anything you can do. Hoodwink being culturally insensitive to Australians. On this bottom lane, PA, she should have a fine time farming. It's really just when you get speared. 
that you are immediately screwed. Standing close to the trees is a big no-no and I like how they just took away most of the trees on this bottom lane. LBZS, they may have the worst end of the draft handed to them here, but they seem to execute it really well, seem to make sure that, you know, just by getting outdrafted a little they haven't automatically lost any of these lanes. Hell on the contrary, if Phantom Assassin is able to continuously keep these trees gone, I think all of a sudden the Hoodwink isn't a strong hero at all. I love playing Hoodwink myself, I think it's such a fun hero, because you do a little bit of everything and the Hoodwink ultimate it has a huge amount of kill potential. 550 damage this early on. Okay, now we've got the first spear on the Wind Wyvern. Mars still alive. Bok has to run out of there though. He is taking down but will be just fine. Hoodwink trying to get the Wind Wyvern kill in return but Wind Wyvern got a fairy fire. So no first what's happening here. Everyone just gonna be completely fine. I still think it's a positive trade for P and C because they just traded a bunch of one charges that PA kind of has to give away anyhow just by farming with the dagger in exchange for fairy fire so you know Wind Wyvern gotta keep that regen being ferried and gotta make sure you're out of nuke range speaking of the Wind Wyvern yeah has to eat a tango there to be able to maneuver through the trees and use Ooh, Arctic Burn as well, but Arctic Burn means Winter Wyvern is gonna live. I think this bottom lane, it's gonna be the most likely of giving away the first blood because, well, Pango plus Marcy do the exact same same thing that Mars plus that Mars plus Hoodwink wanna do. Just the second one of the two heroes punishes you for stepping out of position, the other adds the damage to the mix. It's not that easy to do. Y Chen on the mid lane gets ran down a little bit. He is fine. He took the water rune there. He's gonna be able to sustain himself in the laning stage. Oh, oh, taking down back over at the bottom. There is so much kill potential for that first blood to happen at every given lane. This camera work is really stressful right now, but so far we haven't missed a single kill as Albies, yes. That's one thing they do really, really well. If you pick a broken ass strat like this top lane for the side of TNC, or like this bottom lane, which is also just so easy to execute on paper, right? Then LBZS yes, are gonna be able to play around it. They're just gonna be able to shut down your strategy somehow. Like they do through PA constantly chopping down these trees and over on top lane. First blood will be the Lich going down as LBZS yes, they end up managing to kite Asta around. Asta he dealt so much damage back to them there, but they don't even care. They say, ah, screw those tangos, we're just gonna keep ferrying us region on the bottom lane now. Mars dropping awfully low, the wand is gonna save him once again, at least for the time being, and the Arctic Burn doesn't reapply, meaning Mars is just gonna be fine. Wasting a bunch of his enemies' mana. Has to be super careful now, staying in this bottom lane, low health. Over on the top lane, TZY, he got scanned out. And he was in the process of teleporting back, so I think Asta knows full well. He's got the lane to himself right now. He can free from this Lark. It's sharing the top CS spot with the Phantom Assassin, so Bobofar, really scary. Cream of the meta. Let me just put it like that, like the two most popular carries in the meta pretty much. Especially to pick against one another. They're both farming really well. Phantom Assassin is actually out farming the Slark a little bit, as Slark didn't expect to lose his Lich in such a fashion and now has to be careful. Not the best hero for farming under the tower. Oh, we got Pangolier going for a dive. Frost Shield is gonna allow them to disengage and kite around a little bit. Mavis, he does not have the skill set to deal. With the burst damage coming out, instead it's will. Oh my god, double kill for TZY. This Pangolier is fully online. I mentioned Slark dying is the one thing we need to prevent. 
And at this point, I'd like to say we're playing this on the Chinese server. So TNC Predator, they are dealing with a little bit of lag. But they do lose three people in rapid succession, one of which the Stark, the other the Mars, so the kill potential gets taken away of this really, really dangerous off off lane when it only led to a single kill before Mars now has to play from behind. The Slark also has to play from behind, has to wait his item timing now. You can't just use the attribute steal for some hyper aggression. And all of that space is being utilized by LBVS for Mars interpretation. Invoker doesn't mind, he's playing the Wax Invoker, so he can save himself. But you know, his lane is no longer going to be uncontested. LBZ, as they're fully aware, they got an edge and they try to push it right now where they can. Before it's too late, before you kind of lose your critical momentum. <laughs> Got a rotation over from Carlo though with the Inverse and that should be enough to set up a kill on White Chat. Maybe not with Mars being there, as Chris did not see that one coming. Cross Shield is gonna keep a man fighting up against Nina. So far it's only a mid for mid lane trade, but Moss is got uh, Mavis I mean is gonna be the second one. Dropping there, rolling thunder, delivering the damage from the Pangolier. Yeah, LBZS, yes. they get exactly the start they needed. When I saw that Slark, I was like, okay, this game is over. At least, you know, I get paid per map, so a 20 minute game makes for a really good hourly wage. But nope, now we actually get a game on our hands because PA is still fully online and we're gonna see whether TNC Predator can shut down this PA before it's too late, bring their Slark online to the fullest. Arena is there to ruin the attempt with the Arena onto Sinful Soul. Sinful Soul has the one available to just restore himself back to full mana after getting EMP there. Blinking away, throwing a dagger. Yeah, if you're playing on the Chinese server and you're not used to the ping, you can see a lot of these bushwhacks and other spells not landing and then add to how amazingly LBCS have just been managing the laning stage so far. It puts TNC on significant back foot here. They're gonna try to go for a kill setup onto the Wind Wyvern with the Invoker's massive spell damage. They're obviously just gonna get her here. But it means Sinful Soul, for all intents and purposes, he should live. And Sinful Soul is a hero you cannot afford to live. Well, okay, maybe if you get a really good really white chain kill. Lina is not supposed to be going down that quickly. Invoker, Ghost Walk. But up there, there is the one so he just ends up signing his own death warrant by going in with there still it is a two for one trade it is the kind of trade that tnc are looking for right now as it creates space for the start to farm while pa is not farming so it's a nice little way to help equalize the difference between these two carries if we switch over to network you can actually see that pa and stark are exactly on par now despite stark dying once and pa not so all of that fighting, while it may still have turned out well for the PA and you managed to survive, that still isn't the most effective way of getting gold. Farming is a lot quicker for so something like a Slark. I can't hear you. And it looks like I finally get a bit of a break. I get to chill during the laning stage, at least if Asta doesn't get caught out here. He is doing some tree shenanigans. They don't have the vision to just take a fight at the top lane quite as obviously as they would like to. Asta doing his best to buy space for his tower as the Lich ultimate is gonna be there to follow the bushwhack up and that's gonna be a dead Marcy. Marcy got the rebound off though, saving the Winter Wyvern's life for now as there is the Mars in a follow up. Stark is gonna jump here. Has to block the ultimate. And Winter Wyvern still alive. Out comes the Wind Wyvern first, but that just means she's gonna go down while Asta gets to live thanks to the Frost Shield. And yeah, Chris got himself a double kill. Slark managed to sustain that fight. PA has been pushing the mid lane. We can see Sinful Soul, that's something he really likes to do. Rotate early on those kind of greedy carries. He's going for a battle carry. He has a time kit, he's still ro gonna rotate early, he's still gonna fight early. 
and it looks like now that Stark is there, he is gonna lose a point of agility for that. I like him fighting really, really early, but the second the top fight was over, he should have just been gone from this middle lane. At least with the Laguna Blade, they will get a return kill on the Slark in exchange for the Marcy. But keeping the Slark below the PA and net worth until she gets her Battle Fury is really important. And we can see Sinful Soul now with a bit of a margin managed to make his way back on top of the net worth. Which, if you're already intending to hit that Battle Fury timing, just makes the hero so much more powerful and efficient. Mars getting ran down by two with the Rolling Thunder. PA may not have the most damage in the game just yet, but another crit and Tangalier getting the magical damage that he can't reduce just yet. That's gotta put LBCS 2k ahead. They have all the tier 1 towers that have fallen so far, both mid and the safe lane, opening up the map a great deal. This is lots of farming space just waiting for PA to finish off her Battle Fury. And Slark, he kind of needs to do more. Thankfully for him, there are some recovery stacks available right here in his jungle, so that's exactly what he's gonna be doing. Farming some stacks, making sure he gets a good recovery. He does have the Echo Saber now, meaning this is kind of a really strong timing. He wants to fight around the 13 to 20 minute mark. And with the attribute steal, he obviously has some really good means to do so. Three man smoke coming out from this bottom lane with the Lich leading the charge. We're gonna see if it connects to somebody. I doubt it with the way LBCS are positioned. They are constantly ready to respond to TNC turning things upside down here. Winter Wyvern is gonna get pinned to the arena. Manages to get out the Winter's Curse, but just barely, and yeah. That is still just gonna keep the Slark. It is gonna buy some time, but Pangolier is already dead, meaning they cannot turn around. And TNC, whenever they roam as a big group, you can see LBTS's draft just doesn't have the means to deal with them, unless there is the Laguna Blade, unless there is the Unleash or Rolling Thunder. Hell, I think you need two of these ultimates combined most of the time. Salad, he gets ran down by the Invoker and Chris's Invoker is legendary. No! Okay, I think they got Slark the attribute stolen there. I'm not quite certain though. Fight recap says not. Okay, yeah. I think... I think Slark may just have gotten the second point of agility from there. No, 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 he got one from the Wind Wyvern, so no agility for the Slark. He forced his invoker for, you know, not cooperating with his teammates. I'm joking, of course. You still just need to absolutely secure the kill there before Marcy gets the rebound out, so obviously throw all the damage you got. But as a Slark, it's really frustrating when you know, oh, I could have gotten an extra point of agility there. I know it's just one point of attributes, but trust me, Slark players care. Every point of agility counts. Every point of agility is also a point of agility taken away from the enemy, of course. And it will be Echo Saber straight into the Agon Scepter. I mentioned him having to finish that before PA gets to BKB. But PA, she is well underway towards BKB. Got the Battle Fury and now Sinful Soul's farming speed has just increased so freaking much. Mars committing an arena for Y Chen. That is only gonna force his BKB. But Y Chen did, did just drop the Laguna Blade, meaning if TNC are able to reinitiate here after having reset, they can still take a really good team fight now, and they know it. Everyone on the mid lane knows it, so LBZ is hiding in the trees, making sure they don't just get engaged. And they got a feeling there's a lot of people here. Nice Hoodwing ultimate, just firing it into the, the choke, spot, choke point there, after you realize, okay, we can no longer go on the Lina, because Y-Chan was the original target, but at least this way you rest, this way they won't all be full health if you have to fight into them right now. Central 
Marcy. Locked down, taken off the map once again. But little kills like that don't matter. You can see LBZS constantly staying on top of that wharf just off of PA's farm. And this PA, or at least the Lina, they are the two kills you really need. Because whichever one of the two you neglect is gonna come around looking for revenge for the other teammate. You have to shut down both of them. Lina is currently shut down. This is not gonna be that hardcore right clicking late game Lina anytime soon. But when PA shows herself again, she's gonna be KB finished and she is gonna be crapping out damage all over the place. Carlo gets taken apart by White and can use the kills to just keep himself in the game and Vogue goes for a very nice teleport out of vision there so at least he will be out. Still LBZS what they're doing is creating space for the Phantom Assassins and they realize yeah PA is long gone from this top lane. Asta is gonna be able to farm. Skullbasher is gonna be quintessential to item I feel like for the Slark. You cannot just man fight the PA when she presses BKB and starts hitting you in the face, even with the Slark ultimate and the ability to full heal yourself mid team fight, it's just not gonna be enough against the crit. PA, she is about to crap out damage the second she joins the next fight. And the Mars Arena this time around getting thrown in the face of the Bangalore. Zero man Winter's curse just to keep Buck from advancing on more people there. Because with the Blink Dagger, Winter Wyvern would have definitely been dead. This way you're maybe dead. Yeah, you are definitely dead. That's a double kill for the Hoodwing. Well deserved at that, because TNC Predator, they look in a place to push the tier 1 tower. And. You know, I did say how scary the PA was several times at this point. Just making sure PA doesn't find a way in to hit people in the first place seems so freaking important. Slark, gonna run his way up to the top lane. He is looking for a kill on this Lina. Wai Chen, uh, tough not to crack, but he does reveal that Aghanims. Wai Chen, yeah, he just reveals the BKB in exchange. That was the 8 second BKB, so. You do take away a second of Lina's magic immunity by that commitment of the Slark, and it's not like he expended a lot outside of his mana pool. You gotta see another smoke gank as TNC realize just keep the aggression up, just keep running at them, and I think this is where Southeast Asia really differentiates itself from China. Asta will get a kill. It will not lead to more free agility being stolen by him. He's still trying to wrap around, trying to go for the Wind Wyvern, but... Decides against it for... Okay, maybe not. He has the double damage rune. It's... Oh! He just doesn't connect, and yeah, he's just gonna harass them back. But look at this, it's 20 minutes, and... LBZS have to rely on tier 3 towers to keep them safe. You do not want to be forced to stay up the high ground there. Slark just spamming some voice lines. He is having the game of his life. It is one of the best heroes and he had a doable game. Not, I wouldn't say it's easy. I wouldn't say it's hard either. Catching Sinful Soul is hard, but they will do so. And that's a dead PA. That's just a dead PA. Sacrificing one of her agility to the Slark, who's gonna keep it for the remainder of this game. And... You didn't activate the BKB, I think that's the little ray of light. You still have the 9 second BKB. Imagine if she had activated BKB and then just died anyhow. Though I think a BKB TP would have actually saved her, right? There aren't any BKB peers with stuns. So that's why I said I think Slark beats himself Skull Basher. Right now though. Yeah, Slark. He wants an Orchid Malevolence over the Echo Saber, actually. That's my bad for not calling that right, but he did disassemble it. So the Echo Saber was a bit of a temporary item just to allow him to get killed and then turn into a Bloodthorn. I really like that little tech that Slark is going for. Making sure you get value by disassembling that Echo Saber. 
Because I don't think Echo Saber is particularly good. But if you can just reuse both of those items, one of which for your Aghanims, which like I said during the draft already, was mandatory to complete at a given time, at a really early timing here. That seems like a way to guarantee you get your Aghanims timing at a relevant moment. The Rose now gets taken off by LBCS. They are so happy with getting a free Rose like this. This is exactly the ticket back into the game, at least if they don't lose a really bad fight now. Tenfold Soul procs the BKB, starts running down the Mars with the Frost Shield, no longer able to do so. So instead he's gonna run down the lift. Pangolier is the only kill going around in exchange so far. Sinful Soul, not the target you wanna focus by. Why can with the BKB? But that is all the BKB is used for the side of LBGS. This is where they have a chance to turn this fight around. Maybe too late as Phantom Assassin already goes ham, making that a double kill. Winter's Curse onto the Slark just to keep him locked in place and help deal with him. But he is not afraid of getting high ground kited by the Winter Wyvern. Lich gonna keep him locked in place at this time around. His team is gonna leave him the kill. I bet he was screaming, my agility, my agility, or something along those lines in chat. At least I do that a lot in team chat. Notice me, yeah. Notice the Slark. Whenever he's there, just don't steal his kills. He needs the agility. But that was the double BKB, and one of the, them was 9 seconds, both of them were 9 seconds actually if Dota's to be relieved, but no, fight recap is just freaking broken on me again, I thought, so yeah, Lina, she is down to a 6 second BKB now, but that was 9 second BKB PA, and it was still an equal trade for the most part, 50 gold is not worth it for LBCS to wear down their BKBs like that. But tier 2 is gonna drop Slark with two supports behind him, it's just a raid boss. He's gonna get frost shielded, he's gonna get his targets held in place for him by the bushwhack, and there is just in general so much follow up for the Slark hero. I think Asta is just too unkillable right now, and I think this is where the Lich really pays off too as a pick. Because PA, she is kind of the one hero who can, in the current patch, I feel I contest the Slark well enough. Those crits, they, if you get accidentally critted, make it impossible to utilize your ultimate, and with her attack speed, she definitely gets a lot of them flying your way. Looks like TNC just trying to set up a tower trade with this top tier 2 will not succeed in doing so and lose a very high value objective that they would have rather held. The map exactly symmetrical again. The Aegis did pay for itself just by getting that one objective. Because buying time against the Slark, that's the name of the game right now. Mars gets broken, gets Laguna Blades. He turns around for the damage block instinctively. But as he was already broken, Lina is just gonna crit him in the face for some huge ass damage with the silver edge. Slark in pursuit. He is looking for a Lina kill. But she's got that silver edge, means she will get away. Slark, if he's smart, notices his ultimate getting stripped off of him real quick for just a second there. But Hoodwink goes down. And LBCS coming out ahead of the laning stage, trying to snowball that lead right now may have been enough to at least put a damper on the Slark, keep him from being the raid boss we know and love. At least I love him. I can understand if Chad hates him. Not, like I said, he's one of my favorite heroes, but you know, if you flame him, I understand. Just don't advocate for Slark's agility steal to be taken away and we're good. They can nerf him in plenty of ways that would completely break the hero. Ребята, 
Clark wants to double down on the stat heavy build here. Going for Scotty right now. As every bit of attributes, every bit of armor you get helps you survive the PA. I think armor is the most important part, but having that plus the health pool will actually allow him to get the ultimates up. Bloodthorn keeps PA's mischance away from bothering you. Ooh, that's unlucky for the Pangolier. But Stark just so happens to be there, and yeah. Look at how he goes within many range to, to attempt to get his agility for just a second there. Sell it, force to proc the BKB and teleport out of there. Does manage to get himself away. But now there is no Aegis anymore, and that means Asta wants to run at you. And PA kind of, who has been doing an excellent job of avoiding the Stark, Kiting him around or going for everybody else has kind of been starting to get more and more lackluster. Why Chen? BKB TPing out there at the bottom lane. Did do a great job shoving it out. And TNC Predator, on the one hand, they are the aggressors. This is exactly the zone they like to play. Constantly be running at your opponents getting more and more and more until you're finally able to close up the game. On the other hand, should they miss too many of these rotations, then that's gonna be some massive negative value. Marcy, just gonna get chopped apart, I think? Yeah. Stark's dominating and Asta once more, because now there's another juicy support over at the top lane. Nice blink away from the Winter Wyvern means she gets to live. Meanwhile, Sinful Soul, with the blur being activated, just ratting out the lanes, making sure that even if TNC win a team fight, they can't just go for one objective after the other off of it. Keeping tier 2s alive, I feel, is really important for the Radiance. Although, I think LBZS, they do need to take this period timing to kind of find an engagement. Maybe around the road pit when Roche spawns, it's not that much longer. We're gonna see in 35 seconds when he's gonna be up. And PA got an old fire to make Slark's life a little bit more difficult. That is gonna keep him from pressing the blood torrent that goes around her, eva her evasion. And Slark, yeah. Remember when I said Skull Battle was a really important item in this game? He just picks up a casual Skull Battle before going for Scardi. Asta, excellent understanding of the game. 10 out of 10, Mavis. He will get Sinful Sold. Phantom Assassin dealing too much freaking damage for these supports. Does she deal too much damage with this large? We still will not see. But TNC Predator, they do respect the fat PA. They know what the hero is capable of with the right items given the circumstances. Pangolier. Ooh. Easy why, yeah. He got overkilled hard. Sinful Soul is in the Roche pit while Slark's drawing down the Winter Wyvern. And that means they are gonna pay dearly for this. I may not know in which fashion yet, but look at Slark just. Count Rain and Gold Embrace. Two buybacks have been committed there. Which just leads to Mars, BKB, TPing, but he will not make it thanks to a lucky crit from the PA. And that lucky crit, I think, just opened up another shot at this road for LBZS. TNC, they want to contest it. They do not have the Slark ultimate. They don't have a shard or Slark either yet. If the Sunstrike tries to kill away the road, won't succeed. And that is another Aegis going the way of Phant Phantom Assassin. Slark, once again, in pursuit. He would love to get himself some more of these juicy support kills. Just keep killing the supports without the supports. If you have the lich but PA doesn't have supports behind her, that's the way to get yourself an advantage and maintain it for the remainder of this game. But the buybacks do pay off for LBZS and 
On paper, their lead is growing. I know that the way Slark works, you don't care about gold as much as heroes like PA. Like, PA cannot really play from 5k gold behind, but you don't automatically win from 5k gold ahead because of that. Still, as long as LBCS are just able to let their hard carry do some work, they can come out ahead here. TZY, baiting the Invoker out of position. Invoker presses the BKB in order to survive a turnaround of the Marcy though. Now they know Invoker BKB is down? That may be worth starting a fight around, as everybody is already being brought into this Radiant Jungle. Nice Frost Shield from the Lich, Mars gets the top low fire, he will just die in two hits from Sinful Soul. This PA deals so freaking much damage, it's ridiculous. Lich now gets cleaved at parts as well, and yeah, without a good initiation, TNT are actually super far behind, as this fight just goes to show. They have made it look impressively easy for the side of TNC, but a large part of that was finding good initiations, was being able to get Slark exactly where he needs to be every single time, almost every single time at least. <laughs> That is gonna be the last tier to tower falling. PA just makes short work of objectives. LBCS, they have no reason to push high ground. I mean, they do still have almost 3 minutes left on the Aegis, but may as well first get PA her satanic, so that we are officially dealing with a 6 slotted PA, who is only missing an Aghanim Scepter. And I don't like the, f the Phantom Assassin Aghanims, I think it's super kill dependent, when really what makes PA weak is that if you hadn't had your good battle for your time, you were not able to play from behind this well. If you kind of, yeah, like, I gotta add, PA is better throughout the pro team more so than the pubs because, oh my god, with the double damage we're coming in and delivering a one shot onto Mavis, just a straight up one shot from full. That's gotta hurt a support player. Oh my god. Hoodwink gets caught in the tree line as well. You may have to scurry, but scurrying around alone doesn't do enough. The Winter Wyvern Ultimate comes out onto Asta Slark, forcing Slark to activate the ultimate. With an arena, he is still able to continue the fight, but the disarm does kind of take away from his step out. WW Chris goes down on his CT pet invoker. Fuck dies as well, and we're gonna see some Vibex coming out here. Hoodwink already committed to us. Now you need more to defend this, right? Slark and Oak cannot keep doing this. Lina is finally starting to right click for a ton of damage. Pair that with Phantom Assassin's arm reduction and Frost Shield isn't gonna save the Drax. It's gonna buy a little bit of time, but it's not gonna save them. The Winter Wyvern did get sniped by the Hoodwing. Well, not actually sniped, she still has the snipe available. Meaning more damage to be had. Slark tried to kill the Nina in the middle of her entire team and will succeed at that. Amazing play from Asta. Asta looking for more, he needs to get it. Otherwise, PA can just tear him a new one. And with the Lich ultimate, that will be a dead Pangolier. Slark pretty fat and he finds Sinful Soul. Sinful Soul silenced up. Where is your mischance now? He says. Cross the mini ultimate. And this Slark has so many stats. They had to commit their buybacks. They had to give up a lane of Rex, but it does lead to a full team wipe for nothing. TNT Predator, they stay calm under pressure, they completely turn the game around. I gotta say, if anyone had died back from the side of TNC, they would have just lost the game right now, but instead... Yeah, that is gonna be two lanes of Rex, I think. The Slark is a lot... Sure, he pushes slower, but he's a lot better at fighting under the tier 4 towers as fighting behind the enemy Rex, while his team is pushing the Rex. 
Yeah. Was the alacrity? Okay, I take that back. Was the alacrity actually hits building three really well too? The stats are kind of starting to find out. Fade out, I mean. But definitely a second lane of Rex. Getting this bottom lane to make sure it's automatically pushing in. Kind of the insurance that TNC need. When do I want was sitting ready with a curse? Doesn't find any juicy enough targets that you can guarantee go down though. That's just the thing, Starkey is now staying away from his team. He knows full well, giving your teammates a hug and may be a great show of affection. However, it also means you immediately get punished by it for it by the wind wyvern. TNC grouping up once again. Where are we gonna roam with four people? Five people actually. As on the back line, Slark made sure to be close enough as well. They want the enemy bottom lane. But what's the saying go? Great great minds think alike, right? So LBCS, they smoke up, looking for a kill around the top lane, thinking that, hey, there has to be somebody here, right? Nope, just, everybody is bottom. Fun. Everybody is looking for the remainder of your base. And... I think TNT, all they want to do is force the teleport back. Finishing off one lane of Rex, finishing off another lane of Rex. And there they got the TP they were looking to bait out from Y Chan. That's too much tower damage committed back already. And now TNT just back to base, reset once again. Roche can respawn in 30 seconds. The third Roche of the game. Should be the final one from the looks of it, regards of who wins this. And it's still anyone's game though, TNC, they are heavily favored. I did say that Slark was gonna have too easy of a game. And for all t intents and purposes, yeah, if Dota yeah, was a, a balanced game... Well, okay, maybe if Dota was a balanced game, then the PA wouldn't have gone as hard either. But LBCS, they were so close to being able to end the game. So close to being able to finish. And then they just felt the power of the Slark and his... Like 15 seconds of uninterrupted iframe during which he full heals himself. Okay, LBCS do accept that they have to take the situation head on. There is a six slotted Phantom Assassin, I mean. Not like you're scared of anything other than the Slark. Yeah, waiting for the enemy to push is not a viable strat. Oh, Roche is about to respawn in 8 seconds and TNC. They get a lucky scan on the Roche pit though. I think they know what's up. Yeah. They, they're gonna head for the Roche pit. Roshan, it is stunned up. They are trying to just... Find a way to go for this Roche. On the side of LBCS, but they know full well they can't just go in the pit and kill it off without several people showing up the bottom lane or something like that. Hoodwink will set up on the Mars if you wait and snatch the Aegis there actually. Asta gets hit for a lot of damage by the Phantom Assassin, but look at the Slark going ham, getting himself back up to full health. It is a 2 for 1 trade, 2 for 2 trade now, with a dieback on the Hoodwing. Hoodwing has been having huge impact, so her dying is huge. So both, both support and your mid laner have to fight back for that one. The Lina is especially important. But now, Davis goes down as well. Where is the Slark when you need him the most? Well, he's pushing out top, as he can't realize without the ultimate. He cannot take this fight height. 
head on. That is the third road. Okay, it was a refresh shard. Marcy has it on her. So we're gonna see a double unleash come out from the Marcy, I guess? Nope, gonna have the refresh shard to Phantom is interesting. And it looks like LDDS, they say, alright, 50 seconds, no buyback. These 50 seconds are the 50 seconds we need to end. And I think the window is closing, but it's not over yet. And Megas, they are impossible to push against as a slark. You are all about the single target damage, you are all about hitting heroes, you, whose attributes you can steal. Slark, let me go ham on White Chan. We'll finally be able to do so. White Chan goes down the first time. But. Okay, there we go. Big arena. Making swift work of the Lina for the most part. Slark, though. Has to be careful. Okay, will manage to get himself away from the fight and instead just leave his entire team to die. The second he has to back out of the fight. It's an absolute disaster for the time TNC. Finally the Hoodwink comes back, saving Slark's life, immediately turning on the Fortune Soul. Slark alive and well. He's just gonna wait to regen up a bit to keep the defense going. Both teams only hanging on with one lane of Rex. This is such a close game. Asta, he is gonna turn on the Simple Soul. He is unable to get too many hits onto this Phantom Assassin. Why Chen? He died to that hoodwink combo elsewhere. There is so much going on at the same time during every single fight too. I love it. This is some chaotic Dota. This is why I love working with Moon Studio. There is no other studio that writes Dota like this. And sure, I know people like betters get really salty when stuff like this happens. But you just go into the tournament thinking anything can happen. Then you usually expect these sort of things. That. No top tier 2, meaning even with 2 being dead for the self LBZS, there isn't really a reliable way to punish this right now. I think Slark's really sad that this double damage rune goes to waste, judging of how well the hero scales on a DD. But then again, there is kind of that mix, right, between fear of the Phantom Assassin just double critting you, and the want to constantly go in and hit people in the face because you're a Slark and that's literally your job description. <laughs> Finally, TNC Predator are in a position to push down the top tier to tower. Top tier 2 will get taken apart. And Slark, he finally finds his way in. A nice save from the Eagles. Coming out from Pangolier. Pangolier saved by the A on this. Slark ganged up on the Arena trying to save, but no, the double crit is there. Oh my god, I did mention the risk of him being double critted. That's the one thing that as a Slark you can do nothing about. And that's exactly what happened here. Just two crits for... Oh my god, yeah. I wish I could see the coup de gras. I, w I really want to know. I know one of the coup de gras was almost a thousand damage though. Chris. KB, 3-man tornado, he's trying to make space for the Slark without letting the enemies get Megas, he's doing an excellent job of that right now, but Y Chen is punishing the Hoodwink for her teammates' actions across the map, and 
Now looking for more in the form of Buck, who is a super easy target. Stark wanted to buy back, may have just cost TNC the game. Okay, yeah, he has to buy back right this second. They held on too long, for and people died, and now... Oh, that's a bit of a throw if they don't turn the game around immediately. Slark jumps into just that, and... Yeah, okay. It's still a Slark. It's still the most busted hero in the patch, and this is why. Other than the double crit, nobody can really stand their, stand their ground against you. Slark finally going for a BKB. That is a really handy item in this game. You just need to get Megas before your opponent does. Then again, PA, unlike the Slark, can actually death against Megas for really, really long. Because he obviously has a ton of cleave damage. Slark wishes he had cleave damage like that built into his toolkit. And with that, TNC approaching the Radiant base once more. It's pretty much anyone's game right now, from the looks of it. Slark with the Alacrity just gets to work on the tower. TCY. With the Rolling Thunder, you can slow down the Slark, but you cannot stop him. Instead, Slark will stop him from the look. Yeah, that is a. Uh, Still on the tank on here to immediately has to buy back with the wyvern. Gets locked in place by the hoodwink, making it plus one. And now you only got a pangol here and the Marcy left to defend. Five seconds, four, three, two, one. Asta, he just wants to end. He plus BKB. Starts hitting the engine. Has plenty of invincibility left. PA though. Hurt damage, maybe too much to finish. Mars, nice spear pinning them to the engine. Slark just have an arena to hit the engine. Is that going for a simple soul? Hopefully that's not a mistake. Simple soul still alive. And yeah, TNC trying to reset the fight. They will catch Simple Soul once again. And GG, I think. Nope. Buyback is still there, I forgot. Y Chen also. Holding his own. 49 minute game. This is such an amazing first game of the day. Bok goes on down, but look at that nuke damage coming out with just, an, with just a Divo Blade and the Sharpshooter. That's like almost an insta-kill on the Phantom Assassin. That's how you deal with PA. You can be the best Slark player in the world. You can have the best Slark game in the world. But how you counter Phantom Assassin? You pick the squirrel and you embrace the squirrel. You just grab Phantom Assassin by the nuts. Hey, now that there is a Phantom Assassin, so that, that joke actually works for Phantom Assassin as well. Nice. That's worth remembering. TNC Predator. They had a superior draft, and I think that's the only difference there was this game. There was some bad decision making, and like I said before, TNC, they do have to play with China server ping. That is something that... Good luck, <laughs> just good luck. It's pretty unused to some of these, well, most of these players actually from Southeast Asia. And you could see them hitting their spells more and more the longer the game went on. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that amazing open. That was only game one for today. We have way more Dota coming your way, so don't go too far. See you guys in just a second. I hope the second game is going to be just as exciting. I would love to see LBZS pick up a Slark for the next game. Or Slark just not to be there, that would be cool too. I don't need to see him every game. Just, you know, give them a taste of their own medicine. Anyhow guys, see you guys after the break.
Dire <sighs> Team Ban. Radiant team pick. Dire team pick. Dire team pick. Radiant Earth Shaker. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. I can be a little bit louder as not to wake my neighbors. Man, it's really hard containing my hype for that last game. Well, not being able to be loud. Holy crap. That was such an amazing game number one of the day. And we have at least like the second one is really promising because LBZS, they are the type of team that hold grudges. They are a really proud team, and not necessarily in the bad sense either, because there are some players, right, that if you tip them, they will tilt and they will start playing worse. So a lot of teams go into the game starting to tip, starting to spam voice lines, just being shitlords, right? There's no better word for it. And then they go like, haha, now you're tilted, now you're playing worse. That stuff don't work on LBCS. LBCS, they are the type of team you upset those guys. Now they're pissed. Now they're focus mode. Now you got a problem on your hands. And well, I really hope that PNC winning that game from what looked like an almost lost position. Holy crap, it was so freaking close. The second one, I just hope it's going to be as good. It, last game... Game number one, it was the perfect opener to any tournament you could wish for any day at a tournament. And Ten seconds remaining. it's best of two. Well, I usually don't like the round robin format that much because these best of remaining. twos, they often feel anticlimactic. I would really like a one one here. I would really like another super close game here that LBZS close out just barely before losing themselves. And we got two more best of twos after that too. Dire team ban. Sometimes Dota, especially with a schedule like today, is the day that just keeps on giving. Last game of the day, or the last seconds, best of two of the day, I'm also really looking forward to, because. I still think Five Kobolds got more to back. them than they showed off the last time. Dire TNC team Predator back. this time around, they banned the Slark themselves. They say, okay, you know what? That thing the caster said after the last draft of them picking a Slark against us seems really scary. Well, with this opener, obviously you need the Slark out of the draft. Once you have a bad rider, you just need the Slark out of the draft. But bad rider is another really, really strong hero. Ten seconds remaining. Honestly, I do prefer LBZS opener, although on its remaining. own, it's weaker than TNC, right? You get what I mean. Like TNC, they got a Marcy Bad Rider combo. You can always set up the lassos. You can always just have that initiation you're looking for. Though, these are two heroes that don't combo as well into pretty much everything. Like, Puck and Earthshaker, they got natural synergy going on between the two. You can set up Echo Slams with the Dream Coil, of course, but you don't need to. You can pair these two with any hero you please that has remote source of AoE or Stunlock or both. Hell, it's amazing what these two together are capable of. Radiant team pick. <laughs> Lich once again gets picked up by LBCS. I don't like the Lich on his own Ten that much. Well, he's a great defensive support. I think the current meta just doesn't allow for defensive Five supports. When there is stuff like the Hoodwink, right? You saw what Hoodwink did last game. She Radiant disengaged team. and then re-engaged with like a thousand, a literal me. thousand damage into somebody's face. Lich, he much more benefits from being pushed against. He doesn't really want to chase after enemies after turning the fight around. So I think to really make the Lich shine, 
LBCS have to pair it with a suitable carry for it. Maybe a PA again, maybe something along the lines of an Urza. I think Urza is kind of underrated in the current patch. That hero got a lot more capability. Oh. Okay, okay. Maybe this was some next level read from LBZS because Lich obviously a great counter for the Chronosphere. But with the Skyrath mate being picked up and the Marcy Batrider already available, I think this Void pick is still super good for TNC Predator. Void obviously the most contested hero in the entire game right now. He is more popular than even the Slark and he is so busted. I see him in all of my pups and I freaking hate this hero so much because of it. People just... I can understand it. Void is very hard to play against. He's very stressful to play against. If you can't estimate the time wall cooldown really well, he will stomp you on your pups. But that doesn't mean it doesn't piss me off every time my teammates silence half a second after he time walks and stuff like that, right? That's another reason why the Skyrim is a really good pick with the Void, though. Because Skyrim is also a beautiful counter for the Void right now. And this has caught LBCS kind of off guard. Now they're like, hmm, crap, what do we do with this Lich of ours? Maybe they wanted the Void for themselves. Because once you have a Void to set up the Lich ultimate, then he becomes aggressive, right? On his own, he cannot chase, he cannot find aggressive ultimates. The enemy will just Delta split. Sure, maybe you will get a support kill out of the Lich ultimate, but that's not worth it. With the Chronosphere, different story entirely. LBCS, they pick up a Venomancer. And that could lead to some really good carries that they would really like to pick up here, being banned. But on the other hand, I see Venomancer here. I like it. It deals with the Void really well, it deals with the Squishy Skyrim super well, and it adds slow against the Bad Rider. So even if you do get a really good lasso off the back of that Marcy rebound initiation, it's still not gonna be enough to just insta-kill somebody, right? At least not all the time. If Venomancer hits the scale on the bad while he's lassoing, that's gonna make things difficult. Once you get to BKB, that's no longer an issue, but you do now have to pick up a BKB on the bad rider if you really want to get the maximum benefit out of this game. Ten seconds remaining. Radiant team. That one coming. Rope! Rope! Man, Asta, he's just spamming out the voice lines. Okay, the timer stopped there for a second, cause we had Ten a disconnect, but Y Chen is back in the game. Mind you. Five seconds remaining. They have to deal with the fun that is China server. And China's server can be really bad at times. Oh, Abaddon and Oracle getting banned out. So LBCS, they already realized that TNC just planned to play 4 Protect 1 with a Void picked up. It's almost always 4 Protect 1. It doesn't have to be, but it's the easiest way to get a hyper carry like the Void online. So why wouldn't you if you confidently know Void can just 1v5 with the Chronosphere available every single time? That's what the hero does. Oh. Yeah, that was... I was gonna say that, I swear. I swear nobody's gonna believe me, but I was gonna say Void can also play alongside other carries like the Ember. That was literally what I was gonna say, and he already got picked up. Remaining. Crap, okay, um, now I gotta call the LBZS last pick. Slark gone, Phantom Lancer gone. P... PA not looking that good either, honestly. I don't think you want a Phantom Assassin here. Too much magical damage for her. I'm gonna go back and say I still think the Urza would be worth picking up. And it's just too underrated. Chaos Knight nowadays, he doesn't carry hard enough for that one position. And he doesn't survive Chronospheres all that well considering his huge health pool. Like sure, you got a decent chance of survival at a Chronosphere. But not well enough to go to the late game that Chaos Knight really shines at as a carry. So LBCS, they are out of options kind of. Could you go for a ranged carry like the Luna? Luna would also be a good one. Ooh. That's a hero I haven't seen in a while. I know he's not unplayable in the current meta. I know a Rave King when he comes online can do a lot of funky stuff. I just haven't seen him in a while. And now I'm wondering, is there a reason I haven't seen him in a while? Or is it just because you do not want to draft around a hero like the Rave King when there's heroes like the Void who can do the exact same thing?
Man, that is one beautiful void loadout. I just like to say that at this point, this is how you really get the most out of the Arcana. Not like I can ever afford the Void Arcana. Compendiums have gotten expensive, guys. Am I the only one who feels that? Everything has gotten expensive. And now the Compendium requires, like, another extra hundred levels for the Arcana, too. That just hurts, you know? <laughs> I'm still having a blast grinding up my own Compendium. As long as the enemy team doesn't have a freaking void every other game. <laughs> I've gotten really, really good at keeping track of the time while cooldown too. Just because the hero is so freaking popular. And LBZS, I'm not gonna lie, I don't quite see their draft work here. But I also know that Sinful Soul is a really good Rave King player. So maybe what they lack in terms of having like a superior draft, they can make up for with pure skill and pure momentum. Because this is the type of game this is the type of game where if your draft comes online, if you're able to actually find the ultimates, find the good initiations, then all of a sudden this isn't that bad anymore. On the contrary, I'd say it's quite good for them. You just need to end before Void comes online. And you can slow down Void coming online, we've been over that with the Lich just denying a Chronosphere kill. But Venomancer also needs to have huge amounts of impact, he needs to play like a carry, like a semi-carry, yeah, he's got the Urn of Shadows picked up, and TZY of course knows what he's doing. I have absolute faith in this guy. Still, last game, LBZS lost with a tiny margin, and their draft looked a lot, a lot stronger compared to this. I'm not sure how well TNC fare against hyperaggression. I know there are some teams that if you throw them off their game enough with a draft like this, with like the Venomancer and the Puck coming online at the same time, and you're just having those two huge freaking cores at your disposal. That will just ruin their game plan, and then they don't know how to respond to that. But I don't think that TNC are the type of team that you can just throw off their own game and cause them to lose the game that way. They scrim too much for that, they practice too much for that. They are one of the, if not the scariest team in the tournament right now. And speaking of TNC beings... Wow, voice lines, gotta love them. Honestly, I do. I think BM and trash talking in the all chat, it's such a large part of Dota, and I did mention it before. LBCS, they are not a team that gets thrown off their game by being trash talked. You can tilt these guys, you can tilt, yeah, tip them. Hell, tip them when they die. Even better. Because LBCS, they will not tilt in that sense that they play worse. They will play better when tilted, at least a lot of times that I've seen that from them. Okay, so let's discuss the matchups, starting off with this classic mid one. Cause Puck against Ember Spirit, it's matchup as old as time. And depending on the patch, it really worries who comes out ahead. Ember Spirit should be able to get superior last hits until the rune control really matters. But Puck has superior rune control, so Ember Spirit kind of relies if he wants to truly win the lane on supports coming over. I doubt that Asta can spare Mavis' Skyref mate anytime soon. And I'm happy we see a cheesy Y offlane Venomancer. I think that's a fun hero to watch, just from sheer entertainment value. Ooh. With the Fissure, they're gonna try for Mavis just as Venomancer has the level 2. And yeah, this is the type of play you need. Get yourself first blood on that offline Venomancer. Play all around that momentum. All around the hyper aggression. This time around, when LBCS get the lead, they cannot possibly let it go. L double W is gonna get ran down. Rip the lid. At least it wasn't the first blood. But, you know, Rave King, he still doesn't want 
to see this bad rider come online too soon and get scary. Oh, and disc. Okay, so we just had a screen freeze there. Who doesn't know it and love it? Teams instantly pause and it's just a second. So there is no major issue. And this Void Arcana, it looks so sexy, especially with that hammer. But I know that the Void Hammer, yeah, it's expensive as hell. This thing, good luck affording it. Good luck affording the Arcana too, but this loadout, they fit so well together, like they're made for one another, right? Because the Arcana also just has the blue-silver-ish color pattern going on for itself. And you know when there is only cosmetics to be talked about that the laning stage is pretty boring. But I think a boring laning stage right now is exactly what LBTS want. Bounty, bounty. Nice bounty steal there from Salad, who even tips Chris. It's like, oh, thanks for wasting your last hit. I'm trying to steal a bounty from me, the Earthshaker. You fool, you absolute imbecile. <laughs> I mean, I don't think Chris minds either. These guys, they've played so much Dota, they know the ins and outs. They know that if you get tipped, if you get BM'd, the enemy is just trying to tilt you. Asta still just spamming out that notice me in the team chat too. Over on top, Marcy will manage to tower dive the Rave King. Carlo really well played and L double double you without the Mana to do anything other than watch his carry die, so the safe lane already been lost by LBZS. They still have an excellent off lane going off the back of this Venomancer. They're still keeping the pressure up on Asta and Ve Venomancer plus Urbshack. It's such a strong combo. Look at this Mavis, he's just gonna melt to the poison. TZY, he may die for that one. He will, yeah. Accepts his fate. Just uses the chance to poke the void as low as he can. So that if he comes back into the lane, he can kill off the void. But Asta has gotten a kill and zero deaths. Rave King has gotten zero deaths, uh, zero kills and one death. So this is a really, really bad start for the side of LBZS still. I love the offlane, but the offlane is kind of the only thing they've got going on for them. And it's not enough to compensate for Rave King just being up against another one of those super hard combos. We talked during the draft about how good Marcy plus Bad Rider is, but that combo comes online so early too, and it's something that's if you don't play either Marcy or Bad Rider and have a mate who plays the respective other hero, you are not gonna be able to play against that combo. That's one of those things you need to play it yourself to understand. And only bullying the void with an Ember Spirit mid lane isn't gonna be enough. Ember Spirit has now gotten First of let uh, has now got first of CS and Chris would make for a huge kill target if they can get him indeed on the mid lane. I don't think they will as it's that Marcy comes on in, tries to set up under the lid and that's just dead lit once again. He is the position five feeding is kind of part of his job description. In exchange they do kill off Asta on the bottom lane with Venomancers. Just too much damage over time to handle, so finally a kill, a much needed one on this void. But the way I saw LBCS win this, if they were to win this, was that at this stage they were gonna at, at least have the gold sponge that TNC got going on for themselves right now, if not a 1k lead or something like that. Because everyone other than the Rave has insane late, uh, has insane early game. But not really the best played game. Speaking of the Rave King Sinful Soul, he gets tower dived with the Firefly. Will manage to crit down the Bat Rider at the last second. But that alone, it's still 
I don't think it's gonna keep you in the game, right? Like... Uh, one and two Rave King. He's opting for the first item, Radiance 2. It's like everyone in LBCS is doubling down on this momentum. Is fully aware just how early they need to win the game against the Void. And that still makes things super difficult. Void though, at this point, his lane may become unplayable. His lane may just become unplayable. Ember Spirit is there, it makes things difficult for the Earth Shaker. But Venno gets himself out after killing off the Void. Is now top of net worth, just off of you know, farming heroes instead of creeps. Excellently played. TZY, he has to be the MVP for LBCS to even still be in this game 15 minutes from now on. I don't mind the Radiance at all on Sinful Soul. I really love building early Radiance on Rave King. I constantly talk about how good it is and get flamed by chat for it. So, I hope he hits his timing. I hope he gets to show chat how good it really is, provided you can make it happen. But the main concern for, well, LBCS fans, I'd say, is the Ember Spirit and not the Void, since Void, all his job really boils down to provide the Ember Spirit is fat enough to deliver some damage, is hit the Chronosphere. You time walk in, hit the Chronosphere, and you die. Ember Spirit is still gonna do so much damage, it's gonna be worth it. Lich gets caught out warding, such a support life. And Asta, as per usual, immediately spams out a voice line. Salad in yeah. I don't think they want to bring in the Venomancer just yet. 40 seconds cooldown on his ultimate. Can they defend this mid tower for 40 seconds? With the Frost Shield, should be able to, right? Because that's how LBTS need to play. They need to only take fights they can win, and they need to make sure every fight they take is a 1 1. That's the bottom tier 1, and there is TZY coming towards the mid lane. He says, hey, do I see and hear an Asta farming? That is not allowed on my watch. Nope. I really like the custom pings that the compendium adds. You can straight up ping a bomb and stuff. Now over on bottom lane, we got Dream Coil ready. We got Earthshaker in position for a follow-up Fisher Dream Coil onto the Void. He is silenced, he is feared, and just make sure he doesn't even get to press the time walk. Still, do not overfocus the Void if you're LBZS, because... Okay, okay, at least Ember Spirit isn't going for a greedy build. He's not going Maelstrom nor Desolator. I would have totally loved to see an Ember Spirit. I would have totally loved to see an Ember Spirit Maelstrom and a Void Maelstrom. And I know double full magic build, magic damage build isn't that great, but Ember Spirit can always pick up a Desolator up in Maelstrom, Maelstrom just to make sure that you kind of well survive through the wave of aggression that's gonna come out of LBTS soon. Ember gets stunned, gets cleared over the Fissure, a follow up stun from the Rave King. But he doesn't quite go over the fissure. Now a lot of damage coming out from the Skyrim Rage. Is that on its own gonna be enough? Not quite easy. Why he gets the ultimate up, gets this post up on the high ground. Carlo still should be in a bunch of trouble. But Lich goes down and yeah, there is the Ember Spirit coming in and showing he doesn't need damage items just to crap out a ton of damage himself. So he is gonna die. Thanks to the Lich buying back and immediately teleporting back in. Going for the cleanup. Park would really like to be able to pursue the Skyrim Mage here. Man, if only he had a blink dagger. And he misses the dream coil. Oh my god. Mavis, he just baited out so many of the resources of LBZS. And LBZS had to commit a buyback for that. So, so this is still not gonna get them the gold lead that they are looking for here. Instead, it means LW Dub is gonna. He in a bunch of trouble, the ult not bouncing, but it will slow him down enough for Rafe to arrive, and the fighting, it is just never gonna end. 
Carlo now turning back around onto the Earthshaker. Earthshaker is gonna drop to the Ember Spirit coming in with the Slayer of Fist. And this time around, Rave King, yeah, he doesn't have an ultimate anymore, meaning Void just gets to pull ahead. He is now opting for the Maelstrom into BKB build. That is pretty much the obvious mandatory items. Ember Spirit, he's got the Orb of Corrosion just to enable the Void during his Corrosion Spheres a bit better. And look at, let's look at that fight recap. There were two Fireflies used, 26 Napalms. 26 napalms in a single team fight. Three frost blasts, three frost shields, it's ridiculous. Five freaking illusory orbs, four fissures. Oh, I love this matchup. This is the greatest matchup to happen to this tournament so far, and I hope we get to see these teams face each other again in the playoffs. It's just such great Dota action and how they constantly try to outskill the other. Puck feels the power of the Marcy to his face. 2k gold lead for TNC and I did say that Rev looks superior. I am kind of rooting for LBCS. Well, I am rooting for the 1-1 to make it more likely these teams will meet again later down the line when we get into the playoff territory. Okay, I'm just gonna take a breather, sip my tea while looking at any interesting items coming out potentially. So far, not really. Puck is going for the Witchblade. Rave King close to his Radiance, but not quite there. And Venomancer, he went for the Midas. I think that's noteworthy. I personally really love the Venomancer Midas. I think his late game scaling is highly, highly underrated. He's still an agility carry with a decent amount of edgy gain and a really good right click animation. You can turn Venomancer into a full blown right click carry if you really need to. And I think at the current rate, especially with the gold lead, 14 C growing instead of shrinking, they definitely need to. On the mid lane now we have another fight break loose. This time around with the blue. With the puck just getting used after dropping the beam call on the ember. And it is gonna be a 2 for nothing for TNC. Yeah, I think the window is closing here for LBCS, and it is closing rapidly unless TZY can just own the next team fight, which on paper he has the potential to. Still, I'm gonna be honest, that super long team fight at the mid lane is gonna make it worth it for me. I've had to cast my heart and soul out, and that's what I live for. That's why I'm doing this. Okay, gold lead still. The bad rider we haven't really talked about, mostly because Bok is trying to opt for the BKB first and then in Blink Dagger he went travels. That's worth pointing out. And yeah, that's just the thing, TNC, the longer the game goes, the more options they have and the less damage LBTS has. They still get a nice kill on the Skyrim Mage, but just to kill on the Scarif Mage if you're not able to transition it into something isn't gonna get you back to this game. Venomancer putting up some nice Venom wards. Denying the rune in the face of the Ember Spirit. Leaving him without rune charges and slowing him up as well. But this is all space. And I thought TNC would have to create space with their blood, sweat and tears of their supports constantly chain feeding right for the Void just to stay in this game. Instead, Void's free farming. At LBCS they don't really know what to do about that. They do have the Radiance now, so this is their main timing to force a fight. This is their main timing to go on the aggressive. Earthshaker, he draws a little line, wants to snipe the bad rider in the jungle. He makes for an easy kill. Very nice pickup to get. Верхнюю 
Panamancer going down to Cardo this time around. PNC going for an invasion, and with that invasion, Puck could catch the Skyrath Mage as a punishment. Yes, they will. That is the first one out. And here you see Rafe with Radiance finally starting to do some work. It's gonna chip away at the Marcy. Everybody takes some visible damage from fighting around Sinful Soul. And Sinful Soul, he now also has some much needed build and right kick damage, forcing out the Ember Spirit BKB at the last second. Okay, that's a decent fight, I'd say. Not a good one, though, because Void is still just doing whatever he pleases. This kind of feels like that Slark before PA started shutting him down right where he was just in exactly the position he needed to be. And at some point PA got scary and Slark couldn't get in the position he needed to be but that's not an issue for the Void because with the Chronosphere everybody is frozen and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Lich gets caught once again. Somebody's gotta be caught. May as well be the position 5. But LBZS. I don't know. I expected so much more from that Radiance plus Venomancer being available at the same time. It's supposed to be the. the big get a team wipe for only a support dying combo. Or maybe both supports dying if need be. But they still haven't gotten a team wipe at all. Hell, they're happy if they kill off the Void. Just kill off the Void. Puck, after dropping the Dream Coil, now has to play a little bit carefully. Venomancer, oh, the Venomancer ultimate actually misses. I bet TZY feels really awkward now. He just used the two minute ultimate and it was just misclick. Not like I feel it. Not like I feel it matters too much. What matters is killing the void and the ember and the ember spirit. Just take turns, left and right, killing one or the other. Lich ultimate gets thrown out, but ember spirit. He is fully ready to destroy that with the Mars. They are gonna get another one. Two for nothing so far. And Cardo, he is ready to sacrifice himself gladly. So for the ember, he says, ember spirit now opting for the maelstrom. Okay, going BKB into Maelstrom, I actually approve of this for a change. Because he already procced the BKB to make space for the Void. And that alone paid for the item, considering how Void has a Midas, has some excellent XP. LBZS, where is that fire? Where is that hate? I think they really were setting themselves up for a Void pick. And they got blocked with by this Void. Because I don't think Rave King was what they wanted. And I'm not saying Sinful Souls Rave King is bad, on the contrary, I think he's one of the, if not the best Rave King players in the world. But I just don't think Rave King is a good hero particularly. The only reason Rave King would ever be considered a good hero is in the position 3 because of his Aghanims right now. And I think the Rave King Aghanims is actually underrated a little. Void gets caught, but he has BKB and 3 man Chronosphere ready. Have you caught the Void or has the Void caught you? Well, Esther is more than happy to answer that question. And a lucky badge on TTY too! Meaning three people just go down. Three people try to gank the Void. And all three of them are just straight up dead. 6k gold lead. Honestly, I'd like to hype you guys. I'd like to tell you how close the game is and everything. But really, it isn't. It isn't, and I don't think it will be at this rate. Cheesy why he is opting for that early Aghanims. I think that is the last thing, keeping themselves in this game, because yeah, the damage, especially the percentage-based damage, of the poison Noah being increased with such a low cooldown, it makes the Aghanim set really good. Once you have it on the one minute cooldown, that's where the fun begins. That's where Venomancer is just constantly up in your face, ruining your day. Tinfall Soul 
He gets caught. He reveals BKB. It's gonna hit the Ember in his face for a lot of damage. And... See, Rave King... He's great in terms of what he can output damage-wise and such. But that's why nobody picks him anymore. He's just so immobile. You need to buy a Blink Dagger. And you still got equal carry potential to heroes like the Void. We have a built built in mobility blink dagger. I think that's what that's what makes Void so OP as well. Time walk is both a movement spell as well as a heal. So you can use it however you please. And Void's still gotten quite chunky. This guy can take a beating to the face and then time walk it off last second. I wonder what TNC are waiting for, but obviously the players can't see that they're 6k ahead. If they were, they would probably have been the one to engage this fight. But now instead, okay, Lich Ultimate once again just doesn't really accomplish anything. Fisher gets dodged. Marcy jumps all the way back as this Rave King is very, very scary. So is TZY, and TZY, he does have mana for everything, he can just ult two or three people, meaning that TNC decide, okay guys, let's get back, one of ours is dead, we can farm for the late game, we can wait for the next Chronosphere to be available, and they got a Chrono, so... Could just drop that in somebody's face. Not yet. Srave King just walks it off. Now a smoke up from TNC. They did lose a tiny bit of their gold each having to disengage and cut their losses. And it looks like this smoke is gonna backfire as well. Skyroblade is the first to go down. It's not gonna be able to find any good ultis, but he did silence the Rave King, keeping him locked in place, making for a very, very easy fight. Look at that void. Just jumps over to the Lich, kills off the Lich, and then jumps back over to freshly reincarnate. Reincarnated the Sinful Soul Rave King and the Sinful Soul Rave King is gonna go down as now Void on the chase. Seven K gold lead for the side of TNC. Like I said, I think it's the initiative that's missing from LBZS. Some of you may know this, but my favorite, like generally Asian team, in particular Southeast Asian though, they are Neon, and I feel like Neon would have ran this draft so much differently. Now Venomancer gets dropped with a uh, Mystic Flare, Lich Ultimate bounces once again, kinda underwhelmingly, but what are you really gonna do if the enemy has BKBs, right, that just does render your Lich Ult mostly worthless and if you're just able to get a kill out of it, you call it the day. You're a support. It's not your main job to hit really great ultimates. It's your main job to keep people safe with Frost Shield and Sinister Gaze and Glimmer Cape. And that Lich has been doing a really good job of. My tries travels faster, faster. Okay, so we're gonna sit around waiting, TNC biding their time, because why the hell wouldn't they? They got nothing they're waiting for. They could just sit around here, play the farming game. Farm simulator, right? What else do you need to do to win this? It's all up to LBCS, the boss in their court. Rave King's BKB is getting down and Rave King going for an Orchid. Interesting decision. I am not sure I like that choice. He is farming a little 
uh, Rave King. Why did he summon skeletons? He could have stacked that camp another time and then summoned them. Okay, they need him for a fight, but it's not really a fight, it's just Earth Yank dying. Yeah. Void, he's got lifesteal, he's going for the Mjolnir. And now there's Roche with the Unleash. Also, gonna drop surprisingly fast. In comes TZY though to contest it. But they don't mind too much. There is a Chronosphere. I think TNC won a bait. I'll be the S into contesting this Rose. They can find a multi-hero Chrono. Yep, there it is. Called it. And LBZS. They fell straight for it. Rave King just being knocked around over and over again. Void tries to destroy the Lich ult. This Lich ult was really good as it lets him kill the bad at least. But even a good Lich ult at this point of the game is just a drop of water on a hot plate that is this Void draft. Sinful Soul now thinks he can contest the Rose. Gareth Mage buys back as Void without the Chronosphere. Obviously not quite as scary. Nice ultimate from the Venom so that means this Roche could actually go the way of LBCS now. It will probably, with the Emissary dying, being dead for one minute, Asta has a BKB, so he is gonna run down the Earthshaker, and they know they need more. They want this Roche for themselves. It's the grand prize of this team fight. It is not something you can afford to pass up. Venomancer is fortifying the Roche Pit with his wards. All of those disgusting centipedes. Ready for action. Man, these centipedes used to be so expensive and now there's just a straight up sexier Venomance award skin. Mavis will be pursued and will go down to the white and then no time to switch blade. Maybe that was the comeback that LBCS have been looking for. So, I'm not really sure what went wrong. I think just... Rave King being the primary target of that two-man Chronosphere, like you got Rave King and a support, and wow, thanks Dota. Then, the, then there is buybacks being committed. With the Rave King still fighting, that doesn't seem like the way to win a team fight. You did effectively focus the tank, right? You did effectively put all of your resources into the guy that just doesn't mind that much. Imagine if they had Chrono the puck at the beginning of the fight there. White Channel would have just been dead meat. And he doesn't respawn unlike the Rave King. Top tier 1 now gets pushed down by White Chen as LBCS do take this opportunity to take charge of this game once more. They wanna be in control and they can definitely do so. At least if they stay together and do not get White Chen caught out, White Chen has an Eon Disc though. Eon Disc Puck. Interesting decision. Okay, he has a Blink Deck as well. And that makes a lot more sense. There is an Echo Slam to try and lock down the Ember Spirit long enough for the Lich Ultimate to finish him off. Ember Spirit will proc his BKB and be out of there. While Sinful Soul still front, like, there is a two man Chronos here. And this two man Chronos here is gonna prevent the Venom Man's ult as well as the Lich from doing anything. So. Yeah. I was gonna ask Sinful Soul any last words. He is man fighting the Void Void with Complex. Oh my god, the Dream Coil being broken though. That was. Who broke the Dream Coil? How did they break the Dream Coil more precisely? Because that was exactly the play they needed. Beautifully played, turning the fight around at last second. Wait a second, whose four step was that? So, Puck drops the Dream Coil, yeah, and then. How did. Okay. Wait a second, did Bad Rider just kill his teammate on accident? Did Bad Rider potentially lose his own team the game by trying to force that him away and this time the Chronosphere at point 0.1 second? Like, the second he was forced that away, the Chronosphere wore out. So maybe he just tried to time the force death play and TNC forgot for a second that they're playing Chinese server and they're playing with Ping. Oh, that would be so awkward if you just killed your teammate there after 
avoid would have just easily won that man fight against the Rave King 2 because now that LBZS can take charge of the game once more, they will open up the map a lot more. They can afford to solve just frontline for them pretty much all day. He's not gonna get tired of that. It's just the Void hitting him that he can't deal with. And then if the Void falls behind this... Spirit is also starting to look really good. Those two together make things pretty hard. TZY though. Okay, he is approaching the thing. He doesn't have it yet. Once he gets that blink dagger, it could still lead to a huge initiation. Whether or not a huge initiation would be worth it. I don't know. Okay, the Skyrim mate will get chopped to bits. Talent is gonna come with the Echo Slam just to have it out before he is gonna go down. And down goes the other support. Venomancer trying to deal all the damage he can to Chronosphere. Not a good one for the first time in this game as Marcy gets kited by the Venomance. The Venomance is still alive but not much longer as Bad Rider gets himself a double kill posthumously. 3 for 3? That should benefit T and C but LBZS, they now have 5k gold lead. They're pushing and Fortress Soul, as uh, Sinful Soul, I mean. I keep confusing Fortress Soul and Sinful Soul. I'm sorry. Sinful Soul front dying so much. It does make for a very powerful strat. They do have to close out the game immediately. Like, win the next team fight? I don't even think you can wait for Roche if it's a long respawn. We're gonna find out in three minutes whether or not LBTS can wait for the Roche. Push the high ground then, but we've all seen the qualifiers, right? Like TI qualifiers. At some point, Void just becomes too strong to fight against. All he needs to do is press Chrono, and two of your cores are dead. At least I get to breathe once again, there isn't a lot to talk about anymore. This game, it's been chaotic and all over the place so far and I do hope it keeps going like that. The first game was amazing, here anything can happen, anything and everything. From the looks of it, Rave King is gonna opt for an assault curse, he wants to help his team fight, he wants to be able to push those objectives after the fight more importantly. And the only alternative to the Assault Curse here that I really would have liked The Aghanims. Like I said, I think it's underrated. And... Chronos here somebody to prevent the Venomancer ult or the Dream Club from coming out, right? So, if the Venomancer just lives long enough to press R and then his Phantom dies, that's still worth as much as an... that's still worth as much as an Eon Disc for him. I'm reasonably sure it is, because the damage over time with the Aghanims from Venomancer is so freaking insane. LBZS are now setting up for the push. Where's that famous Void initiation? Last fight they did miss the Chronos for the very first time. And I mean, sometimes you do miss Chronos, especially if it's there in the trees near the juice spot. But that means this time around they have to absolutely, absolutely hit it as TNT. And with a smoke that is gonna make it more likely to be able to do so. While the smoke is proceeding, I can finally stretch. Ah, 
Autumn mood, right? You think this tournament is me sitting in front of a fireplace, just sipping my tea. But nope, instead it is stressful fight after stressful fight. And this time around, you let the Void front. I mean, that's 90 seconds, no face is Void. Embers Burst does PKB, but he knows he needs to get something, anything out of this. We'll kill the Earth Shaker, so that is some time and space bought for his team. But that means no Chronosphere, and you want to capitalize off of that. Just right now, start going for objectives, and you can't because of the Embers being so good at high ground defense, and because of the risk of a lasso displacing you out of position. Venomancer gets a little overzealous and they do know they need to push as LBs, yes, so they are gonna continue anyhow. There is a lot of damage going on the Mars yet, it's gotta be enough. Y10, he is up to a monster kill by now. And they set their sights on the road. It respawns exactly the second, good call from the side of LBZ. If they can get the Rose, they may actually be able to close out the game, provided they don't just get Insta Chrono. Meanwhile, TNC, all they need to do is hit those Chronos, I know, but it's a lot easier said than done against teams who know it too. Like when everybody knows Void has to hit his Chrono, then suddenly they become a hard job to hit, right? Okay, so with the Aegis available on Puck, it does increase LBZS fight. Oh my god, did they just catch, they just got the Void again, and Void wasn't able to get away. I think he just had the tank on cooldown, right? Or didn't get to press it at all, yeah. He just didn't get to press it at all, oh my god, I think he was spamming like the tank. At least if he's smart, because the tank is an instant cast, time walk is not. But even if he was, if you're just constantly perma stun, look, those stuns are being perfectly chained up on you. I did manage during the draft how I was perfect at estimating the time walk cooldown. And I've gotten so good at just, you know, waiting for the perfect moment to use my crowd control because everyone in my pubs picks freaking void. Rave King gets put out of position. It's not like he minds in the slides, on the contrary, he's gonna stun everybody around. There is a two-man dream coil, and with that, we are gonna see LBZS set their side back on the mid tower. Venomancer just slows heating it up. Smart move. He is super underleveled and still doesn't have his blink dagger. That feels bad, man. He went for an Aeon disc and like I said, I'm a big fan of TZY. But every time he delays that blink dagger, he kind of takes sail out of his, uh, uh, wind out of his team's sails. Oh boy, we got a pause. Such an awkward one, just as the game is starting to get really tense. Meanwhile, I'm enjoying a beautiful autumn sunrise, except it's darn freaking bright. So, I'm sitting at my PC with sunglasses right now, just to not get a freaking cataract. Anyhow, chat, what's your autumn mood like? Is it also freezing with like a really bright sun out? Are you also just like sitting wrapped in a blanket drinking tea, or do you live in the part of the world where it's hot around this time of year still? Because here it's actually like falling leaves and autumn romantic and lots of rain and all of that stuff. The sun still looks like a summer sun, except it's really cold outside. Reconnect, coming out. Not a moment soon either. Редактор субтитров
the smoke, looking to connect on somebody, but the venom words are there to prevent that from happening. Void, once again he's standing in the front. That got the punished once before, Emma Spirit. However, he will fight to kill with the BKB. It's just gonna pick that one up. And there is a Cronus here only on the lid. I don't think that's what they wanted. Void, he crossed his BKB. Got stunned up by the puck and just wasted valuable seconds of magic immunity. DNC Predator. They're kind of making some underwhelming plays compared to how well they played it. Just, well, almost 20 minutes ago by now. This game has been surprisingly long. Doesn't feel that long when every team fight drags on that much. And it's not like we mind falling a little behind schedule too much. If anything, it means the lobbies are ready faster. And TNC are smoking more than a Bob Marley concert, as they know only a favorable initiation can win the fight anymore. But that was not it. Mavis goes down, as will the Bad Rider. Bad Rider. Not using his buyback just yet. Mavis already has, but now Mars dies without a buyback, and so will Ember Spirit, except he has his buyback again. Still, 90 seconds respawn timer on the Ember Spirit. With or without buyback, that's got a smart, and that means these objects are now fair game. Oh my god, Mavis. He gets dived deep by Sinful Soul just to add insult to injury. And with that, finally, Rafe can get the chance to get working on those wrecks. He's been waiting to do that all freaking game. Next lane of Rex gets taken here. I was rooting for the 1-1. One, one. I never expected it to go this way. I never expected LBZS to just win the game off of three underwhelming chronospheres in a row. I expected them to win the game 10 minutes ago with the Venomancer plus Dream Coil combo and then Rave King with his Radiance build coming in the second after to clean everybody up. That's what I expected. Instead we get this absolute... Well, I wouldn't call it a shit show, but Void, once again, you can see he chronos and doesn't even kill an Earthshaker anymore as long as he's just there. That means the strongest carry in the game, Void, is just gonna go down as the carry is only the strongest one in the game. If he hits his Kronos Fierce the way you imagine, they will. And with that, I think it's fair to call GG. Mega Creeps, just make this impossible to death. Well, with the Void and the Emma maybe. But Void and Emma are exactly the two heroes they've been killing off all game. Farming them left and right for that fat chunky goal. And yeah, with that, GG should be called here any second. Now, Puck. Cleans up Mavis once again. Salad did die on the Earthshaker. That is almost undertaking no Earthshaker, but when you're being canned in the base, you generally know it's over and take it to games. GG finally gets called and they held on well. But if the Chronos Sphere isn't there, then what is? Right? What can you do to follow up the Chronos Sphere? And what do you do to enable your Chrono follow? -up? Well, no, that letter quest has answered. Anything you'd rather use as a Chrono follow up, you can nowadays set up with the Gleipnir. But if the Chrono doesn't let everybody sitting there with Chrono follow-up ready, that feels really bad. Or if it just lands on support. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, it concludes the first best of two series of the day. We have two more of these coming up, so don't go too far. More excited Dota action coming your way. Hopefully it's going to be as good as this game number one. Although it felt a little bit weird. It felt, well, it was a little bit of a throw, honestly. Because we all kind of make mistakes and we all accidentally throw a game because we're so confident in our game plan that ends up being a mistake. With that, I see you guys in just a second. Thank you all for watching. Hope you're enjoying the show so far.
Dire team pick. Очередь сил света выбирать героя. Очередь сил света запрещать героя. Очередь сил тьмы запрещать героя. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back once again here at the Moon Studio September mood, and well, it has been a September mood as the weather has been matching. You know, here it's actually starting to really be autumn. And we are gonna go into the second draft, uh, the second best of two of the day. The draft already proceeding quite quickly as Overlord. With a name like that, they obviously have to grab themselves the faces void, right? He is pretty much the Overlord of the meta. But we did just see how to punish a void. Just split push, just stay ratting, and then bait him into really bad Chronospheres. We've had Chronospheres that were being dodged by the Blink Dagger last second while he was in the animation of throwing them. We've had Chronospheres that Очередь looked сил. really yeah. good and that were ruined by the Lich. It's not like Void is unbeatable, it's just that his win rate is a little bit higher than any hero's reasonable win rate should be. With the Jakiro especially, that's nasty, nasty. Like Macropire into a Chronosphere, people are gonna be burnt crispy and... Yeah, obviously, crispy food's delicious, Осталось so crispy people make for some delicious, delicious feed for, uh, for the Void. Death Prophet gets picked up by Gorilla in addition to a Marcy. Great synergy on its own as Death Prophet really oh, likes the rebound. Too. The AoE silence to enable the Unleash to slow everybody also. Very nice. And... The one thing I like about Death Prophet that I haven't mentioned yet is if you have the Spirit Siphon on it, you get Chronosphere, you will heal in the Chronosphere. So altogether, a very solid pick. The Void being revealed this early by Overlord means that Gorilla are gonna draft around them as best they can. And depending on how much they've played in this current meta, depending on how much they've been on that grind, this could just be, you know, another one of those Void losses to fit. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, depending on if it's going to be a 4 Protect 1 or not, because that's why I dislike the Void 4 Protect 1, and I think the only reason the last game was so freaking close is because Ember Spirit was available there, right? You had a backup, you had a second plan to kind of help save your life. Enchantress. Enchantress. Gets picked up now by Gorilla. Okay, see, that's what I mean. That hero can just hit into the Chronosphere from tons of range. Or if you see the Void approaching you, and you get scared and you press an Age's Attendance, then you're probably still gonna survive the Chronosphere. All of these heroes are excellent at dealing with the Void. Shadow Fiend, it's a bit hit or miss. Now that looks more like a Gorilla comfort pick than really an answer to the Void, but you don't wanna just. Have your entire draft be nothing but void counters, th since then you discover like, oh, this is a position 3 void and our entire draft suddenly got ruined. You can still flex pick it in position 3 if you pick a sufficiently tanky carry, like the Chaos Knight or... Hmm. There aren't that many... Well, Phantom Knight gets tanky eventually. Mars gets picked Asta up by Overlord, great enabler for the Chronosphere, great synergy with the Void. Maybe not the best hero to pick into a Death Prophet, Enter, and Shadow Fiend, though. Those are all heroes that can kind of deal with the Mars's inherent tankiness quite well. So, yeah. Seems risky? Seems risky? I'm not sure what Overlords are planning here. They do have the very last pick of the draft. And see the Storm Spirit being banned. I know that's a hero they play really well. And that is a hero that would have also just worked wonders for Overlord here. So that being gone kind of ruins things. I mean, there's Ember, there's Void. I 
I'd honestly prefer the Void Spirit to the Ember Spirit this game. I know Ember Spirit is superior in pretty much every way, but the Remnant answers the Shadow Fiend better and helps you more against Death Prophet. Like, you're not always gonna slay up this chain, these heroes, especially not with Encha Creeps running around with so many targets being available, but you're always gonna reliably reliably be able to cancel the Shadow Fiend ultimate with a Void Spirit in a variety of different ways. Gorilla, they instead think it's the Queen of Pain, would have made Shadow Fiend's life difficult too. I can see why, especially since it's a hero, like, it fits Unlord's playstyle a little bit better than the White Spirit. Urza, yeah, now that's a good ban. Last draft, we talked about how underrated the Urza is and how that hero, in my opinion, is just the strongest of the White. And to see him gone, I think that's the wise move. Then again, I do hope we get to see an Urza in the current patch, because there is a lot of remaining. debate or speculation or whatever you want to call it about how strong Urza really is. And the games where we see him either he carries everything or his win rate isn't as great as you'd think. Ooh. I'm not sure if I love that or hate it. But Juggernaut is a fun to watch hero, so in that regard, we are definitely going to be entertained. The thing is, I kind of feel like Gorilla, they may lack big health. That's the only thing I don't like about their draft. They answer the white perfectly, they can push really, really hard, they can fight early, they can go for Protect 1, they can even go for the late game. Like, if Overlord want to delay the game because their void had a hard laning stage or whatever, then Gorilla are up for that, where they can also potentially end it early, right? All the options in the world are open for them with this draft, except the option of having a tank who can actually just stand still and be hit by the Void for a couple of seconds. So we're going to see how they're going to play it. We're going to see how good they are really at kiting, because that's what it's all going to boil down to, at least with things looking like it right now. That's why I also thought a Storm Spirit would have been such a good pick, like the best of the Spirit heroes for sure. It prevents Gorilla from kiting, it deals really well with the Shadow Fiend, it deals really well with the Death Prophet, and it kind of would have dealt really well with the Juggernaut as well, so maybe a bit of foresight involved, so Storm Spirit doesn't just ball lightning out of the Omni Slash. Um, alright. XY Pango. It's going to be a mid lane core. Hmm. I don't think Pango... Well, on the one hand, you got better team fight than all the heroes I suggested. On the other hand, you now hardly got any disengage, any reset against Gorilla here. So if Gorilla run at you with the exorcism ready, with the enchant creep army, or if they just connect with Doc versus Marcy, right? And Doc versus Marcy is pretty sick. So... Hmm. I don't know. Pango seems really risky if he's gone on. I hope if he does play mid Pango, it's going to be a Maelstrom build, which I know has kind of gone out of fashion that isn't that great anymore for the Pangolier himself other than the farm speed. But farm speed is what you're going to need this game. Like I said, no tanks on Gorilla. If you reach a certain damage margin, then you're going to be able to fight into them quite easily. We're going to see how it goes, though. In theory, this always sounds so simple, and then you see the players just have super hard lane or something like that. Prepare for battle. We will not forget, we will not forget this. We will not forget, we will not forget this. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are in. We got that zero minute smoke coming out from Overlords as well. 
I personally still swear by it. I like it a lot and I think on average it's still good, but it's gotten a lot worse on average than it used to be. It was a pretty much guaranteed way of just, you know, getting an edge early on. Provided you have the team coordination for it, you'd never get punished for it. It would always pay off. Well, okay, uh, statistically speaking, like one in seven or so first blood attempts would fail, but it was ridiculously though. Nowadays, not quite the case anymore. People are a lot better at brawling early and with the new nerf to XP, right? A lot of things have been rebalanced around that. But I still don't think it's gonna be a major mistake if you just plan to use it to go for the three rune advantage. It's always gonna be a net monetary benefit. And yeah, that is three runes going the way of Overlord. Okay, I am gonna look at the lane matchups right away. Uh, as soon as we can rule out any lane musical chairs, but I doubt it. This TNT plus Docris lane, it's too good. Having Marcy and Death Prophet with that stun setup, it's so powerful. And I think Rebound, I don't know, it just kind of feels broken the way the stun scales. At the last level, it's 2.1 second stun for something that also gives you a movement speed bonus that has an 11 second cooldown right. Just nerf the stun so that it gains 0.1 seconds less. I think that would already put Marcy into a lot more balance of a game state. So that you go like 1.2, 1.5, 1.8 seconds stun. Yeah, Mars is feeling the end. This Mars Grimstroke, it used to be such a stable combo. Oh god, I remember. Mars Grimstroke, it was kind of what... Well, the Void and the Marcy are nowadays in terms of how often they get picked, except they also have a really good synergy going on. People may have kind of forgotten that because Grimstroke hasn't been the most popular meta hero anymore. But Mars plus Grimstroke is really overpowered and... Yeah, we're just gonna see... This lane combo probably go ham. Then again, it's Juggernaut. That's pretty much the only hero. Well, no, Juggernaut and Lysteer are the only two heroes that really fare well against this combo due to the built in magic resistance. So, I don't think Fonte minds. And it's always the kill you don't look at. Mars gets saved by the Grimstroke, and instead, over at the top lane, we see the Takiro. Oh, well, we don't see to the Takiro, but Takiro got traded for the Death Prophet. Void already got himself a kill right off the bat. The first blood going the way of Death Prophet may not be great for the Void long term, as Death Prophet with the silence is really annoying to him. <laughs> but yeah, they decided to just go for the trade there, risk it for the first blood. And I. Yeah, this time around the chance is nice, and now the Mars as well, and look at this, at least I catch the Mars kill. There we go. I've been waiting for him to drop so freaking long, because he's kind of meant to. Like I said, the Grimstroke plus Mars combo, Juggernaut is one of the two only heroes that kind of falls through against. So this safe lane, it's definitely very, very favorable for the side of Gorilla here. Jakiro again, come on man. Stop going for these trades, okay? It's not like he's got a choice. He gets rebound and disposed and it's just so much damage out of nowhere that I kinda get how he goes down every time. It's really annoying because these kills are super hard to catch. Like, he goes down from half health and... Well, how long was that? Can you stop dying everyone, okay? Ponte goes down bottom. I'm just gonna look at whoever is lowest health now to make sure I don't miss any more kills. I'm sorry, but this is not supposed to happen. That's not how this game is supposed to go on paper. Either both teams are making mistakes or both teams are just really, really aggressive right now and feel like, you know, 
trading is the way to go and well with this Mars trading is definitely the way to go because Fonte he is supposed to be winning this spot lane so hard and Mars is supposed to be aware of it and kind of stay back. Dockcrest comes over to the mid lane. Sekiro is here as well and guess what Marcy? Try kidding me now without your rebound death profit. Yeah, that's not so easy. Alright. Void has a hard lane, Juggernaut has a good lane, it's definitely looking favorable for Gorillas in the side lane department, or for Gorilla in the side lane department. Over at the mid lane though, Pangolier against Shadow Fiend? That's also Gorilla favorite actually. Huh. On paper, they should be winning all three lanes and have a relatively easy game until the Chronospheres come online. And then the Chronosphere is obviously the really big turning point of how many synergies they have for the Void. Provided you can hit them, of course. Judy ran down, but okay, this time around he is gonna be fine. Manages to teleport out of there. Dockress comes in looking for a rebound opportunity, but no such thing. Shadow Fiend, meanwhile, goes down on the mid lane because, like I said, it's always the kill you don't look at. This time around, at least there was two kills happening, so it's not like somebody got nuked from a significant portion of their health without me catching it. Oh, now somebody may get nuked from a significant portion of their health. Nope. Now, of course, he dodges it because we're there with the camera. Cast this curse is so freaking real, this game. But at least it makes for a very exciting game that Overlord are holding on so well. Because I think the entire game plan from Gorilla is like, okay, we got favorable lane matchups, we just got it. Out and maneuver them from here on out. Shadow Fiend, he does go down once again. As Pangolier trash talks him. Man, Pangolier, he was like my favorite character in the anime, and he was just treated as kind of a joke character when really he is one of the few who, you know, makes sense without having super high stakes. And the typical anime thing of either you're a living god or you have to save the universe or some stuff like that. It was just a pangolier who wanted to help the pretty lady. And I think that's like the best kind of fantasy hero. Not the guys that just simp, but you know, the people that just seek adventure and decide like, hey, can I come with you for the adventure? Because that's actually something people did a lot in the middle ages where most of the village would never leave their tiny little village and you wouldn't really get any good action going. So if you wanted an adventure, you would just straight up risk your life for free to help someone out. No, speaking of risking their lives, TNT on top lane, he is gonna get taken low with three people and absolutely destroyed. I thought maybe a teleport would come through and there could be something happening, but the only one who could have really saved him is Dockress, who is otherwise occupied. Judy manages to stay out of the stun range, albeit barely. Insta D ward and Shadow Fiend, he tried to go for an attack on the. In oh my gosh, he should not have attacked that sentry ward. He should not have attacked that freaking sentry ward. Yeah, now they're just gonna get de-warded and lose Shadow Fiend. Big mistake, Gold Lead swinging around to Overlord, and Overlord, guess what? They have a Chronos here they wanna maybe throw down, provided a uh, suitable target poses itself as. And, sh you know, you don't need a Chronos here to kill her, apparently. Well, until she has level 6, anyway. So now the faceless void just confidently standing in the mid lane saying come at me try and run me down I dare you I double freaking dare you Shadow Fiend he is gonna try his luck PP gets Chronosphere up immediately Grimstroke off the mark with that stroke of fate but you don't need a stroke of fate when Void just confidently secures the kill First Chrono of the game on the mark getting Void the gold he needs because, yeah, Void is not really at the top of the carry. Pangolier is the top carry for the side of Overlord right now. And while Pangolier can create lots of space, like I said, I hope he goes for a kind of greedy build. It is gonna be the super early Diffu play. 
That thing is kind of mandatory by now. It just adds a good amount of damage to your swashbuckle while also being a pain in the ass to opponents. Now Mars gets gone on, gets this post out of the way, gets spun on by the Juggernaut. Throws an arena onto three people though, at least good to experience stroke arena, keeping the match with the Juggernaut in there, and guess what? All three of them get cleaned up for just the Mars who immediately bought back to. Alright! I mean, that is a worthwhile Mars buyback, right? If you just help your team clean up, get a three. Well, let's say the buyback counts as second death, because early on it is kind of worth that much. It's a three for two trade still. And forcing a really good three for two trade when you have superior late game in the form of the Void plus the Hero plus like a Pangolier as well, though I'm not sure how. Late game or not late game, XY is gonna build. It is XY. This guy used to be a freaking legend for how greedy he was on heroes like the Morphling and the Puck. He was the guy that actually ran right click Puck before anyone else did. Back when everybody said, hey, right click Puck is way too freaking greedy, why would anyone play this? There was XY already just running that stuff. And he would make it work most of the time too, provided his carry was too greedy. It was a blast. Mars gets this post at the cost of half of Mars self pool, and with the Rolling Thunder, that is gonna be a dead Mars. Stroke of Fate, sniping him from behind. Pangolier just being a pain about it, dodging the Shadow Feet ultimate, stunning up the Shadow Feet, who is still stuck in the arena, but it is hard to provide a follow up in there as even more teleports come out through. And Gorilla do hold the bot lane, whereas Overlord, they're happy with that. They are just like, hey, our Void's free farming. That's what we're doing this for, right? Void also going for the Midas build. It's like we hardly ever see people skip it anymore. This game, though, I feel is definitely a Midas game. Well, I don't think going for the stale same build is fun or usually that good. Void plus Midas. Nearly always great. Grimstroke ultimate once again means Shadow Fiend is gonna drop. And now XY, he is not quite gonna go down for that just yet. But Deathrock will finish the kill. Now Mars dies to the Juggernaut. Fonte, he has had a pretty significant Juggernaut game. Has had better Midas timing than the Void. Down goes the Jakiro as well. And TNT with the x racism is cleaning people left and right. I actually have a friend of mine who knows TNT like IRL. This is the guy I randomly play and feed Dota with. Oh, Mars calls good game, but I don't think he means the GG right off the bat. <laughs> the all chat coming out, yeah. Oh, I love Dota sometimes. Macro Pyre gets thrown out just to set up a guaranteed kill on GG's dash drop, speaking of the devil. I'm sorry TNT, cast this curse is real, I can't help it. Juggernaut coincidentally building the exact same items as the Void for the time being. Both of them are just gonna go for a Maelstrom into a Manta style even. I like Void Manta, cause the Manta Illus can attack during the Chronosphere and are not to be underestimated, as long as you don't get a Diffu Blade. I think Diffu Blade is too early game of an item for the Void, but... Manta Star in general, on one of the heroes that hits relatively hard and... you know, gets a way of getting a ton of free right clicks in as well. It's a very nice damage amplifier. And the Yasha component, of course, helps you farming quite a bit. Time is mine is money. Press taken off the map once again. It's just a Marcy. She's expendable. That sounds so mean, especially because the anime makes the entire point that she's not expendable. 
But she's literally the most expendable hero in all of Dota. I hope if they do continue the Dota anime that Mars just straight up gets a Skull Basher. I think it would be fitting. Plus it would be really fun to see the little mute girl bash the crap out of people with a big hammer. Yeah, that's the Chronosphere plus Magnifier combo just to make absolutely sure Juggernaut goes down and stays down for a bit. You do not want to risk an Omni Slash coming out the second the Chronosphere ends there. Overlord, they are doing their name all honor though. He's on time being an end and lockdown. That's another one. Dog Press comes in with the just rebound. It's not gonna be enough on its own. Nice fear from the Shadow Feet. It's gonna save life at least for now. Kango looking for a follow up. Will not quite get there. Alright. That concludes things for now. Losing the Juggernaut there is super significant though. Because I genuinely believe Juggernaut under the right circumstances can be a good counter to the Void. Even though Void is super overpowered this meta. Shadow Fiend, PB, he realizes he's just dead. Yeah. And he goes like, well, guys, kill me so I can get back to farming my souls again. Let's not waste everyone's time. Because really, do you want to kite them all the way to your Juggernaut and then risk the Juggernaut dying when you have zero mana to output damage? Also means Overlord. They are now well in charge of the game. Then it, we saw last game that Void is only as good as his Chronospheres are. So a missed Chronosphere can cr completely turn this game around at any given time. But until then we are just gonna see Overlord take charge of the map pretty much farm wherever they want to and say come at us gorilla try your best try what you try what you may nice two man stun from the marcy on the mid lane out comes the grimstroke ultimate setting up a very nice work because that shadow beat dead dog crest still holding his own but for how much longer is now rolling thunder comes on down Pangolier still looking for more he is gonna roll through the trees and up dog crest and oh dog crest lives with one step of HP. Tango will finish him up, and with Omni Slash, Fonte at least gets a return kill out of that, but that is XY getting himself a double, as in the back lines, Judy dies for that, okay, turning it, turning it into a 2 for 2 trade, but that was still a bunch of big ultimates and a lot of space being used from Gorilla, and with all of that space, guess what, Void has just been farming. Okay, now things could actually become worth it. You're gonna see the death drop, the ultimate on the Mars, Mars misses the spear, Throws down the arena, it's gonna be enough to break the... Yes, he is gonna be able to get away. In comes a Chronos, you just on the death rock to get rid of her ultimate. You have just gotten rid of the Exorcism, which is one of the few cooldowns you, ne you need to affect the respect on the Void. And usually you do not want to Chrono the death prophet when she has Exorcism. Because, yeah, obviously the ghosts are just gonna punish you for it. But at level 1 it's... At level 2, I mean, ultimate. It's very much doable. That was level 2. Wait, was that a level 2 death prop? Or did she level... I think she leveled up after the fact, right? Because if that was a level 2 exorcism... It doesn't say in the fight we can sadly. If that was level 2 exorcism, then I'm kind of wondering where death prop's damage went, honestly. To be fair, there was some jungle creeps. PP managed to teleport himself away. Three people looking for him, but that man, he is sneaky. Illusion, illusion. Void manages to dodge oh all of that God. combo. Just casually sidesteps to his pose as if it's nothing. Realizes, hey guys, I should probably shouldn't be standing here. And... Yeah. Honestly, I think this is a good chance for Overlord to fight if they feel so inclined. They don't have a Chronosphere, but everybody else got their stuff up. A good arena is already a team fight here. Boy, farming himself some stacks, making sure he gets a really good BKB timing to allow keep finding these amazing Chronospheres, and gets gone on with the Pangolier's help. That's gonna make things a little bit difficult. 
And boom. Out comes the Grimstrokes. Drunk secure. Done securing the kill. Ooh, nice escape from the Marty. Juggernaut, he is frozen up by the hero. Out comes Grimstroke Ultimate. But there's the Omni Slash to return the favor. Judy goes on down. And Mars with the arena available is still just kind of awkwardly running around. Not finding it the way he wants to. Yeah, that's a thousand gold swinging around off of a single fight. Void is still farming really well. Death Prophet is still having pretty significant impact. But Juggernaut, if he manages to snowball this gold lead, okay, yeah. Kill off the Juggernaut. Fast. Because, oh, can they even do it? No, Fonte, he just gets to live. He tanks through all of that, through the arena, through the Master Fire, putting some really important enemy spells on cooldown. And I think from here things are gonna start looking a little bit hard for the Void, maybe. Because Juggernaut, for those unfamiliar with him, or unfamiliar with him in the competitive scene, he only really competes with a Void if he's several thousand gold ahead. But when he does, he generally doesn't let go of that lead. He's generally one of those heroes who just snowballs so hard so well. Marcy gets ice pathed up. Juggernaut coming around for the wrap round and Django gets chopped into pieces. So we got Juggernaut firmly sitting on top of that work. PP comes in, cleans up XY. And scouts up the high ground. I do not think you mind dying here too much, but you're not even dead with nice pose. Still, now that means Marcy is in trouble, and that is a two-man chronosphere. The stun Marcy is gonna go down, and despite Shadow Fiend with the double damage rune hitting into it, Void BKB TP out. That was his 9 second BKB just used for TP. That, in my opinion, that always feels bad. I, If I was the Void, I would've rather ran out and risk dying then proc a 9 second BKB. If it was a like 7 second, 6 second BKB, obviously you BKB TP. But 9 seconds, that feels bad. I think it goes to be so much more valuable against this Fonte manages to get himself out. TNT doesn't. TNT though, with the spirit type and the ultimate. Gonna be able to tank through this, gonna be able to survive, allowing the spirit to deal some more damage to heal her up soon when they come back. And TNT looking for more with the spirit side. Does do some significant damage to the Pango. Lear Pango is careful, and Pango, he is not careful. In fact, he rolls straight into a free Omni Slash. Now the Void goes down elsewhere to Marcy over at the bottom jungle. While this fight is still continuing, Exorcism is gonna come back, and I think with that. Yeah, Gorilla, they are where they wanna be. I did mention Juggernaut, it would be scary if Snow was that gold lead, and guess what he's doing now? Marcy comes in, tries to help Juggernaut, looks for a kill on the Mars. Can they kill the Mars though with BKB? It looks kinda unlikely. ENT, able to keep himself alive with the Spirit Scythe. Ooh, and the Yules to prevent Grimstroke from sniping him. Once, just to keep that Prophet alive a little while longer. And Grimstroke feigning the skill shot just in case she has another getaway card. Down goes the end as well, and only as Evan Juggernaut survived. I mean, Juggernaut is the important part. He needs the gold deed to stay like it is right now. As long as he manages to do that, everything is entirely fine. Juggernaut. Okay, they do not dare to commit on him even without the Omni Slash. Because spin, of course, spin TP is kind of scary. But now Fonte picks up a double damage rune, and with that, he turns onto the road. 
just goes, hey guys, three Aegis. And look at how fast this Rose drops too, with the double damage Jagger getting tightened up, trading for 600 hit. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I don't think they even knew what was going on. This fast Rose this early on is super unlikely, and the only real scenario in that which occurs Oh boy, Mars Arena and able to live and get off the nature's attendance, but not for much longer. Ink tendrils pretty broken. That ink swell coming in touch every single time. Be it for the damage over time or for the stun. Nice Grim Stroke Ultimate 2. Keeping the Jugger at bay. Void. Went for a solo chrono on TNT's death drop to want to do a little bit of ratting and CP goes down to this Grimstroke as well. Grimstroke, interesting item, item decision. He's going for the Ethereal Blade above an Aghanim Scepter. While I don't mind the Ethereal Blade, I do think Aghanim Scepter here is really really good for Grim. Especially Juggernaut, that's one of those heroes, you make the Illu off of him, you start right clicking someone. Everybody is gonna melt. Jugger Illus just right clicked so hard, the tech animation is really good. And he yeah, has enough dumb. stats that's and dumb. enough health that you really don't want to focus Juggernaut, be it an illusion or otherwise. XY wanted to go for the Rolling Thunder, but won't. Instead, we got Grimstroke teleporting out from the Death Prophet Ultimate. Oh, and all the ga all the ghosts are set on the Grimstroke, I think. Yeah, they were chasing the Grimstroke until they had found a new target in this tower. That was some weird ass action behavior. Marcy tries to rebound in, doesn't quite hit what she wants to. Jagger comes with the Omnis dash and goes with the spear. He is still alive, but she didn't get press spin there. Alright, Tukiro seems to be the next on the chopping block, but is away. No big ultimate means that. Yeah. Aegis is down. Now at least it's a fight on almost fair footing. The Juggernaut, he is looking for victims. And Gorilla, well, they are 2k gold behind. And Void is really fat. They got pushed, right? Like Gorilla with the exorcism can just walk up the high ground as easily as Overlord can with. Well, actually, Overlord got way worse push between the Void and the Takiro, that's about it. Whereas there's an Ench, a Death Prophet, and freaking Jack who also hits towers really well. Oh, and it looks like Dockress, he tried to. Somehow slow down the void. Why are people running at this void? Who then proceeds to throw one man chronosphere. That's happened twice now. One time while that huge fight at mid was happening, and now another time to, you know, keep things consistent. XY, he gets saved by the Grimstroke once again. And nice job going on to the Enchantress. She should almost be dead. In comes Pangolier with the Rolling Thunder. And look at that. Pangolier, he is just gonna die for it. Maybe not? Yeah. That was kind of to be expected. Alright, so with that, only a 1k gold lead for the side of Overlord. Death Prophet. Come on, sprites, sprites. With the exorcism trying to put some tier 3 damage in. 
Jungle is there too, and Objective Gaming is the best shot Gorilla I have at winning this. With the BKB, they are gonna go for the base. Just force people back into the fountain. Obviously, once the extra season ends, they gotta be scared and go away. Their entire power curve relies on having their big ultimates, both for the Death Prophet and for the Shadow Fiend and for the Juggernaut. It's kind of fitting, but Omni Slash is still available, and that is something Juggernaut would obviously love to put into somebody's face. We are just gonna wait for the next push attempt. Two more minutes till Roach can be back. Mars, he presses Unleashed though, goes onto the Mars. Mars has a BKB, but the BKB alone isn't gonna save you here, my friend. Instead, he goes on down two main Chronos here from the Void with a BKB and Enter stands there with an 8 Sentence ready. But 8 Sentence alone aren't gonna help you much. Juggernaut, he gets rid of all this, he turns around for the Omni Slash, but he doesn't even get to press Omni Slash because he is an absolute glass cannon. Gold lead or not, well, the gold lead by now it belongs to the Void. And Void says, well, Juggernaut, I don't need to be ahead to Snowball, but I'll still take the lead and win the game anyhow. The only one still alive is the Death Prophet. It is a 4 for 1 trade. And with 4 for 1 trade, 5k gold lead now for the head of Overlord. It is Overlord's first series of the tournament, so I think they are happy to try and make a good impression. Though in my opinion, if you pick Void, my, my impression of you is already lower. I've just seen my share of Void. But I can't blame anyone for thinking he's OP because he is, but that doesn't make it any more fun to watch, right? Pangolier could be in a lot of trouble. X, Y. Ooh. Dies to TNT. Void will not make the same mistake. TNT. We're siphoning up, but against the Mars, what good does do you except for wasting a perfect good exorcism? Now out goes the arena for another kill trap. And another kill. Okay. And the hero gets chopped to small pieces. Rip Django. Sometimes it do be like that though. Void going for some severe push. And he's not quite dead, meaning he can time walk the damage off and just be fine. Another push like that. And this Void should just get the tower. Hell, he even has the Chrono Spear to just drop a Chrono, run away if needs be. Okay, Void now building a Satanic. This is gonna be fun. Or not, depending on who you're rooting for. I just love Void Satanic. I just like the Void Time Walk, the way it's super unbalanced nowadays. And Grimstroke. Gets found in the bushes as well. Gets executed by the Juggernaut. Pit. Juggernaut is gonna upgrade to an Abyssal Blade. I wonder when we're gonna see that Jugger Aghanims come out. Cause the Swift Slash, it's a nice way of initiating onto the Void from out of his range. And if the Void does blink in, you already were gonna cast Swift Slash, Swift Slash on him. It'll be quite a pain in his ass. And that is another kill this time around on the Pangolier. Taken.
Sophie comes back to life. Starts right clicking like absolute madman. In comes the Pangolier. Manages to not be feared. Marcy comes back and now goes the Pangolier as well. Fonte, he's bad as hell. Nice to make Chronosphere. That will be one kill. Shadow Fiend still alive. Uh, not Shadow Fiend Void, I mean still alive though. Shadow Fiend bought back, what the hell? Okay, he's gonna try to make something happen here. Double damage Void. Probably would also like to make something or anything happen, really. And it looks like this Void double damage rune is just gonna be turned into more objective damage. But tier 3 tower getting whacked away. And I gotta say, Void's been doing a great job sneaking those objectives, trying to force TP back. Because if you force TP back, it's always this coordinated. You're always gonna pay the price, you're always gonna have consequences. But like this, you trade towers, you come in with no chronos for this time around, so Void needs to be careful. Really, really, really careful. Okay, managed to get away, exorcism has been activated. And there is the spin. Next buyback this around on the Void. In comes the Magnificent Mars Ultimate. But is there the follow-up damage available that they are looking for? From the looks of it, yes, and both enter as well. Shadow Beam go on down. Juggernaut forced to spin and not really has the option of being in the meanwhile. Doctress getting hunted, but gonna be just fine. I think the game could be over any minute now, just due to the Rex dying. I mean, sure, there's only one lane of Rex left for the Void to wreck, but Mega Creeps are a different breed. They are nearly impossible to death against, especially around this 40 minute mark, which is how long most games are nowadays. Dota was the last patch that turned into a quite slow game, which is great, but. Ah, this early in the morning, it doesn't exactly help me wake up either. And there is the wave of Mega Creeps pushed in from the side of Overlord though. They want Megas versus Megas, and that's something we haven't seen either. Oh, I love Dota. Whenever there's a new big patch like this and then followed by a little patch, Dota becomes so exciting. Like, I don't like the little patch, I think it doesn't change enough on its own, but the way the teams respond to it, they've just all shifted their pace down so much, they've shifted their priorities onto objectives a bit more too. Which was already the case at the major qualifier, and now, you know, they're double dig down on it. Rolling Thunder, they do need to get the lane of Rex right now out of this push, otherwise, those Radiant Mega Creeps are gonna pose a problem. And guess what? Juggernaut already is a problem. He wishes he had a Blink Dagger right now, but with how fast he is, does not need one. Nice stun on the Pangolier, he gets the post back, he takes a ton of damage. Juggernaut has to mount a style. Can he fight the Void? Okay, yeah, with a lucky bat. Of course he can. Monster kill for Fonte, the one and only, and everybody else just doesn't stand a chance. Two minutes, no Void. If I were Overlord, I'd call it, but they have held on so well for four freaking minutes. I can understand if they don't want to. Mind you, after this game, it only marks the halfway point. And this was the third game in a row to go over 40 minutes. So, this is a best of two. And after that, we got another best of two featuring Kobolds, who are a team I think is the most underestimated just because they're super inconsistent and admittedly a little bit throwy. But first, 
we are gonna see whether Underlord, uh, whether Overlord can somehow death this, which I doubt. Yeah, there's the exorcism, there's this post in from the Marcy. Grimstroke is just gonna go down with that. Even for the death from. Oh my god, they got the Juggernaut! Gorilla! Gorilla got cocky finishing this! They were like, oh, easy end! And they lose the Juggernaut, they lose the Marcy. PP, he takes the tower. Can he take both these supports? From the looks of it, in terms of damage, sure, but he needs to survive long enough against them. Kiro will go down and PP will kill us the Grimstroke. Uh, will kill us No, he killed us the Grimstroke and the Kiro fought back. Okay. Kiro just didn't buy back. Second Grimstroke died. And I think that Overlord, they knew it was over a while ago. But if the game is that close, then you kind of want to hold on. I really like this Void's playstyle as well. That is a new way of playing the Void that I haven't seen. Just split pushing, prioritizing the objectives. The reason it backfired for them is because their draft was too Void reliant. If this was the draft from a game before with a Void and an Ember Spirit, I think the split pushy Void would have worked so much better because Ember Spirit can defend the high ground a little for you, can buy you a lot of time and space. Something that... Heroes like the Jack Hero, like the Mars. Well, okay, Mars can create a lot of space, but he'd still rather follow up a Chronosphere. Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, with that, we are going to go to a little bit of a break. Once again, second game of the second best of three, uh, best of two, coming up after the break. Man, this is exhausting. You have no idea. All of these fights drag on for so long. Oh, I can finally breathe for a little while. See you guys in just a second with more Dota action coming your way. Hopefully just as good at that.
Viper Slark. This is a very fun to watch. Okay, maybe, chat, if you guys got enough of the Slark, I can understand. Feel free to flame the pick, because it's kind of like the Void. Too much of a good thing. Void, Void is one of my favorite heroes, because the Chronosphere are so hit or miss. They can turn a game around from 20k, for 20k gold disadvantage if you hit a 5-man Chronosphere and your team is there with follow-up. They can also straight up lose your game. But Gorilla, they got a Chen to deal with the Faceless Void. They got a Viper, which I think is just a very, very good hero to combo with pretty much everything that benefits off a slow. Stark is one of those heroes. And Overlord, they now pick the Primal Beast, another one of the most contested heroes. I think the most contested mid laner in the current patch. I may be wrong about that. Like, Bad Rider, he's more often played off lane than mid lane. Wow, now the White Spirit gets banned out. Okay, okay, I can see that, but why not last game? Last game, White Spirit was my suggestion. Now I feel stupid. Thanks. Seriously, though, why the White Spirit? Count as the Slark, that's great. Decent synergy with the Primal Beast? Like, if you want to follow up the Chronosphere or the Primal Beast initiation, there's better heroes. So, maybe Gorilla want to pick something that gets countered by Void Spirit. What's their mid laner gonna be? Puck? Puck's in the draft? It would make sense with these bands. Puck is, after all, counted super hard by the Void Spirit. You can't just face it away from him. And you still don't want to lane again. Yeah, Overlord Bandit. Agreed, guys. We're thinking the same thing. Nice. I'm not a complete noob at Dota. Nice ban from Overlord. I was thinking the exact same thing. And I think they were too. Judging from the fact that Gorilla didn't insta pick. And the last pick, if you don't have the very last pick of the draft, is usually pretty fast. Because you consider it before what you're banning. I they had another option. And that's... Ooh. Gorilla already one game ahead. And this time around, they're actually going for such an interesting draft. I can see this win. I can see this win way too easily. Overlord, yeah, I feel you guys. Take your time, enjoy your reserve time. Think of something good, please, because I don't know how to deal with this either. That's the save for the Chronosphere. That's a great synergy with the Slark. With the Chen, you got a second save for the Chronosphere. Then there's a Viper. All right, that's the Mars getting picked up. I don't think it's okay. Maybe with the Witch Doctor, if Django is always there with a Death Ward, then it can be enough. I still don't think it's great. Like a Primal Beast, the Void Witch Doctor combo, a Grimstroke to enable the combo, to double stun with the Witch Doctor. Right, to double pulverize as well. Everything added up so well. And then the X oh, XY Mars. Um, all right. All right, I'm going to be the first to admit that's not quite what I expected. But that makes sense. You, sw you switch up the rules a bit. You change things around. Make sure PP doesn't get a completely free lane on the OD. Fonte Slark, that does seem 
pretty freaking scary. Приготовьтесь к битве. Okay, we are back. We are back once again with a zero minute smoke from the side of Overlord. Last time around I favored Overlord in their draft. I thought that was how he put together a decent-ish void draft, if not a good one. Maybe it was a bit over-reliant on the Chronosphere, but other than that it was so well-rounded and so beautifully look looking this time around. Eh. I genuinely just think this OD pick like, Slark is already one of those heroes that you have a really hard time going up against. But this OD pick, it ties the Gorilla Draft together so well. It adds everything they need to the draft, including high ground defense. And high ground defense is one of those things that... Yeah, that just goes ham. If OD gets the event the high ground long enough, his ultimate is gonna one shot two or three people at once. Oh, what the hell is happening here? We got a brawl going on with the void dropping low, but so is the ten, but the void looks to be the first blood attempt, and they will get the first blood onto the void. Dockress on his Mars, he will secure it. Grimstroke gets the rune before dying, as he is dead anyways, but he just accepts it. Wants to waste some of. Viper's mana, Slark still trying to run people down. A nice witch doctor stun is gonna prevent that from happening. But oh my god, the Marcy rebound is on point. And guess what, Fonte, he gets himself the first point of agility stolen right off the bat. I think you're pretty happy with that. I genuinely think you're pretty happy with that. The attribute steal, okay, you need a couple to make it worthwhile, right? It's kind of like flashy. It doesn't matter whether you have one or whether you have five, but after a while you start to notice, hey, I got a lot. And then you can play a lot more aggressive on a hero who likes to play aggressive and play forward anyhow. So to talk about the lane matchups, I'm gonna be the first to admit, I have absolutely no clue what the hell is gonna happen at this bottom lane. I have not seen this matchup before. I can try and guesstimate, but that's about the closest I can get you. Cause... Okay, I know Grimstroke plus the Primal Beast. That is a really strong combo that is super hard to lane against. I also know that Slark is one of the hardest heroes to dive in the current patch. And that Chen at level 2 will get a creep army to kind of stabilize things. And that's why I'm so uncertain, because I don't really micro a lot. I don't really talk to a lot of... Well, I know one or two really good micro players, but those are core micro players, right? I don't know anyone who knows the ins and outs of all the creep micro. And okay, nice. They blocked the Chen camp, but it looks like Chen is going to be able to just unblock that block this oh i can talk about the camp equilibrium as over on top lane the witch doctor went down trying to deal with the vibe okay now chen got the movement creep and yeah this is what i'm talking about with movement creeps and stuff is it really that easy for the grimstroke primal beast combo to just dive the tower to just shut down the slark because that's definitely what it intends to do that's definitely the way they would like to execute it if given the choice Chen also has quite a good time denying. That's another advantage of having this creep army to work with. 
Okay, apparently Guo Guo is gonna go down to the Primal Beast. See, now that's a kill I caught, and the return kill for that as well! Oh my god! He does go down to the creeps. I don't think Slark minds. He at least got a permanent agility out of that and can just resume farming. There's worse things, right? It's like the consolation prize. Sure, it's worth maybe... I don't know... 30 gold, 50 gold, something along those lines. But it's something that doesn't cost slots. And for a position 1, things that, like stats that don't cost slots become incredibly valuable at a given point. Slark would have loved to run down the Primal Beast there with the pens, but can. So the Slark plus Chen combo, I think, just makes this bot lane favorable for Gorilla. I'm not quite sure though, because yeah. Chen's timing is a bit revolved around the early game. He did kind of block Slark too from securing a second kill with Creep. So that's a bit awkward, but hey. Dota Path is what it is, and you can't just tell the creep to move aside from everywhere. Not if there's like a tree in the way or something like that. Over on top lane, Dogcrest running for his life, but he is gonna survive. Witch Doctor is not. Witch Doctor goes down. And once again, we're kind of in the scenario where the lanes, both side lanes, are in favor of one team. Because Witch Doctor is crap against Viper. I did mention I was playing against the Vi. I was playing against the Void plus Witch Doctor combo yeah, at one of those games. We tried to play the same combo like a mate of mine. Oh, on bottom lane, no time for me to talk as that's a double kill for Guo Guo this time around. No free attributes for the Slark, but do you really need free attributes if you're a 1-0 and 3 Slark at this point? I think he is a lot happier about gold, so, you know, he can turn those three attributes into a bunch of damage. Over the top lane and attempt to die for the Void, but yeah, by the time, so, yesterday, Void Witch Dog shit over my pups, like really all over it with the death wand and the chrono combo and then my team missed their silences. But then we tried to play Void plus Witch Dog and guess what? We had a freaking Viper against us. And you can see what Viper does right here, right? He just runs down the Witch Doctor so hard, the Witch Doctor. He doesn't have to heal yet. This time around Django does get to live and they kill the Viper though. So a very nice calculation, very nice way to make that work out for them. I was almost certain which sector was that a single tick would have done it. Not even a tick, like one tick from the poison attack or even just the corrosive skin being a level higher. Because, you know, corrosive skin does get amplified by poison attack. Oof, I think Void made a mistake trying to go for a fancy getaway here. Nope, he does get to live, but that means he has to walk all the way back into the lane. Yeah, this top lane favors Gorilla, bottom lane favors Gorilla. Please tell me this time around the mid lane. Oh. Guess what, guys? Favors Gorilla. Gorilla are currently winning three out of three lanes. And as I say, that PP, he just drops the hammer and bam, down you go on Mars. Okay, last game. It was so close. There was so much fighting. I did complain, like, hey guys, I'm gonna. Just do the fast part of rap god all right. That's a lot easier than casting those fights. And it genuinely was. Oh, Slark, he is getting comboed up. Where is your support, man? He doesn't have the ultimate yet. That's a nice return kill for the Primal Beast. Because now, guess what? Pulverize is ready. And that means until Slark has his level 6 or even a bit later, he is going to be in so much danger. Because if Primal Beast charges at you and instantly presses Pulverize, you do not have time for a Slark of either. 1k gold lead for the side of Gorilla still, but I mean Primal Beast is the hero they want to get online the most. Not to hate on the XY Mars, on the contrary, yeah, oh, that's a great arena. But OD got a save and lots and lots of magical damage. With the Witch Doctor, he is gonna get maledicted up. Ooh, PP, nice healing and rebound combo there. Beautifully done to get himself away. Little things like that can just be worth so, so much. I think that was just a lot more important than the support kill to just fairy fire, stick, and thanks to the rebound with his speed, somehow survive. X, Y. He could be in trouble, maybe. Grimstroke, though, there to help him out. And yeah, with that Grimstroke's done and Django's damage, it is not gonna be enough.
All the while, Fonte is just sitting around, is just kind of waiting for his crucial timing. He won his lane starting out, and then he won it a little bit less, and a little bit less, and a little bit less even, and now it's starting to get hard. Sometimes it do be like that. Boy, it's gonna get some help again. And that's the one thing that they've done a great job on the side of Overlord. Perfect rotations over to the side legs constantly. They know they're losing. And they try to alleviate it this time around with a nice OD kill on mid. And now on top lane, TNT has gotta go down as well. But at the cost of the fight, oh my goodness! He kills two of them! You commit four people to the top lane and Viper still kills two of them even if this Marcy would have died. I don't think they would have cared. I genuinely think that would have been worth it. Fonte, he goes down to the Primal Beast now. That's something you're definitely not happy about. Slark is starting to... Well, kind of give away his advantage out of the laning stage to the Primal Beast instead. So OD comes in, drops the hammer, takes the return kill and kind of puts us back to where we were in terms of advantage. XY goes down as well, that's a high value mid kill. Gorilla! They are getting awfully fat! Judy, oh no, he had a case of save his body syndrome. Was looking for a way to help XY and instead he gets put six feet under. Центральную башню сил тьмы атакуют. Нижнюю башню сил света атакуют. Верхнюю башню сил света атакуют. Okay, top tier one getting pushed in. It's not the greatest of pushes, but I don't think pushes is what you care about right now. You just care about Overlord not getting farm on their void and not finding the first Chrono because this is some embarrassingly bad Midas timing, I'm not gonna lie. I don't mean to flame this void, we all have our bad games, it's just... After looking so good last game, oh nice Chronosphere, that could help things out but nope this pose. So Void still goes down and it's just a Marcy kill for Chronosphere, that's totally not worth Now Chen comes in with the creep army. And yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Chen at some point, he starts actually fighting, he starts actually being a relevant force. So he's kind of playing roaming with the creep army. Just running all of them at you at once. Tower. Goes on down, Gorilla, they've opened the map, they have a gold advantage, they have the, the superior draft. The one good thing that Overlord can say is they shut down the Slark. And right, most of the time when Slark is picked, that's my biggest worry, like, can they shut down the Slark? Can they deal with this super favored and super strong carry? Also, someone in chat didn't get what I meant when I said you can't just tell a creep to move side. That was a reference to Dota pathing, sometimes doing the thing where creeps like walk back and forth because of vision or because they block each other, right? And in that case, the creep wouldn't go to the side, like here, because he wasn't sure if this or this was destroyed map, or I think this or this. Either way, like, I meant he gave the command and the creep just wouldn't walk because of freaking pathing. And sometimes it happens. It's real freaking annoying. That's why I don't play micro. Hell, it even happens to heroes. Marcy, she jumps into the Grimstroke ultimate and does not even mind the Marcy. Okay, that's scary. Now Marcy is gonna die. Nope. Nope. I take that back. He's about to pop, says Witch Doctor. 
Dark Press, he is still gonna pop. If only he had got the last hit in on the Primal Beast, but hey, Primal Beast is dead to OD. And while Slark is just farming, OD is making such sick amounts of space. 5k gold lead. And guess what? Even if Overlord are to turn this around, even if Overlord go and they wipe the entire team, Slark has still farmed. Slark is still almost ready for a fight. He is going for a bit of an early game orient build too with the Defu Blade as he full well realizes, hey, ROD is beefy. ROD got 90% of the damage people expect me to do. It's not like I don't like the team of Overlord. I just don't think that this void has worked out for them ever. I don't think team fight worked out for them ever. Full stop, I'm just gonna go out and say it. Give Overlord stuff like the Arc Warden, give Overlord. What else is up there, Ellie? Arc Warden, um, I'm not sure about Morphling, but Phantom Lancer for sure is another one that fits their place though. And I think by now you get where I'm going with this, right? Like, beefy carries and heroes that split the map. Preferably a bit of both. And then a bit of Micro Throne, and that's what I would describe as an Overlord draft. Ooh. Rip Judy, I mean, at least, the, at least the Primal Beast is fine. Lands of Pursuit, a really good item. Viper, enjoying the crap out of it. Getting those 15 extra damage with very high attack speed in on every hit. Oh, D. Oh, he cannot save himself this time around. As the Chronosphere is there, but Chen Ultimate will keep him alive for at least a while longer. And through the Menedict, he's still gonna die thanks to a little help from the Primal Beast. But it still means the Void is gonna go down. And guess what? Now, Doc Chris. Bro, you could have rebound. Okay, okay. Nope, he misses. Well, no, maybe it's this plant actually. Okay. Mars Arena, yeah. You could have rebounded off a creep onto the Mars. Alright, there's Fonte though. Okay. Maybe Marcy. I'm just gonna say Marcy did it so Stark can steal his agility, right? Because as a Stark player, you'll get mad when you support. Don't let people die in your melee range or don't wait for you to steal one stat so you get that one extra agility stone. Void what? Ooh. Still seems super risky to be here. Fonte just grabs some health back. Five agility stolen for him. And he isn't the main carry or anything like that. That would be the job of the OD, at least in terms of the damage that they do right now. OD, ironically, the lowest net worth of the course for the side of Gorilla, though I don't think they might in the slightest. In comes the Chen Creep army. OD left behind by his team gets pulverized. Four people throwing everything they got in his face just to punish him for taking the tower. Yeah, that's why he's the bottom of the course. Oh my god. The Void. Did he just... He teleported or what? What happened there? Okay, so... Judy goes down as well to the Chen Creep army and Chen just trying to solo kill people. In comes the arena. Will kill off the real Chen and now his Creep army gets decimated. Slark still just farming. He wants a BKB. He only wants to take the fights he's safe about. Because outside of the Void and the Primal Beast, I don't think Overlord have good late game scaling. Sure, that's the Witch Doctor with Maledict, which would usually scale decently. Except you can't keep him alive against these heroes, right? That, I think, is the biggest problem. All the scaling stuff that Overlords have 
gets counted. So their late game is really poor, not for lack of opportunity. But even if you hit a good Chronosphere, Chen and OD have to be in it, right? And Slark, of course, because otherwise Slark with the Shard is just gonna save one of the lives in the Chronosphere by healing them back to full. And then we get into the ridiculous territory where you need uh, to hit a Chronos here on Slark and OD at once, preferably, preferably with the Chen. So the Chen heal doesn't waste even more of your resources. So Slark teleports out, leaves behind Dockress. Dockress, he gets killed for being left behind there. Now Void will go for a one-man Chronosphere on the OD. There is, however, a follow-up ready. OD survives a little while longer thanks to the Chen ultimate. Chen is there, dishing out a lot of damage to the Void. Void wants to man fight up Guo Guo, but with the Viper hitting him as well, cannot do that anymore. Oh, Slark the Pounce, barely off the mark. It did that little buggy thing, and he did get Grimstroke ult to try and keep him in place. Fonte looking to pursue for more, but Everybody is just being kited as TNT is that goes down on the Viper. Fonte still hasn't found the Mars. Instead, Mars just able to get out of there with that Test of Faith. Or no, that's Penitent. Test of Faith is, I think, the one they removed. Yeah. Sorry, that's no longer a thing. My bad. I keep forgetting the ability names change too. Does at least have a cool description. Although Chen's brand of animal enthrallment isn't quite strong enough to control the minds of enemy heroes, it still tests their resolve in combat. Alright, alright, that's fair. Stockcrest goes down, meanwhile, once again, kind of caught solo, such a support life. Guess who else gets caught solo? The Grimstruck. Both of them wanted to ward. Both of them died, they're just support kills, they're not really worth mentioning anymore. But Penitence is written, like it's still a, like it's still a dual spell with Holy Persuasion. And we are just going to sit around and wait for the next fight to break out. Gorilla, on the one hand, they're in a situation where they got the gold lead they want. What else do you need? 5k going on for you. Okay, let's reduce to 4k. But even in the late game, they're fine, right? This fight has been counterpicked by multiple heroes. On the other hand, though, I think they are kind of afraid of getting kited without the good initiation. Oh, speaking of good initiation, well, it's once again just the Grimstroke getting pounced on. They will fight the Grimstroke on bottom lane, which means they may be more eager to go for a fight on the side of Gorilla. But their issue isn't the amount of damage or the resources they have at their disposal. Their issue is all enemies run away so they can't click them onto the enemy heroes they want. Now Mars gets caught by the Slark and Slark is hitting hard and stealing his attributes. In comes the Primal Beast. Slark reveals the BKB and goes, Well, I'm not afraid of you Primal Beast. You should be afraid of me. He will take apart XY, stealing another point of Edgy. Now he is gonna get pulverized. Slark has to get out of there, but nope, he is just gonna die. Because guess what? There is nothing you can do against the Witch Doctor. Guo Guo, he goes down trying to help his buddy also because his creep army isn't that great anymore. I am not gonna lie. Wait a second. Yeah, they actually changed it so Voodoo Restoration now also does damage with the talent. Cool. I'm sorry, I was just checking that real quick. While Primal Beast was running down Dockress, TNT presses his BKB and starts dishing out huge crap tons of damage. Can he get two out of that? 
Can he get the face of fight? Nope. But just barely. He's still 1v3 there. And that's what I mean in terms of resources, Gorilla. They are not gonna run out of the ability to fight. Even in bad engagements like that, they can stand their crowd and fight, and it's still gonna be worth it. And you can still just go, like, oh, yeah, space created for Slark, by the way. But I'd wish I just presented space damage built in. I was not sure if that talent also added the damage to the restoration, but it does. And I think this game, it will be really, really good if the Witch Doctor gets that late. I think that would be almost perfect for him. Alright, Primal Beast getting ran down, managed to get away, the Void manages to get away too, and Ponte proves he is the scariest. Duty dies to Viper elsewhere, and yeah, on mid lane, that fight actually results in kills. See, I look away, and the second I look away, Void goes in and immediately freaking dies. Guo Guo did get traded for that. Slark tries to get out, but the pounds off the mark. OD will just commit a save for him. Gets pulverized for it. Slark has no more freaking invincibility cheat codes, so he's kind of screwed. He is the Duke King, but not against Primal Beast. And down he goes, Gorilla. They have more resources, but they did kind of fight one by one with the Viper running down to support first. These fights, so chaotic. Wherever I don't look, the kills happen first. So don't blame me for missing those. That's the cast's curse at work. You saw me look away to spy at where the Grimstroke died, and that second. Oh! Rebound barely half a second too late. Crap, that was close. Nice game we got on our hands, though, all things considered. I did not think that Overlord would even get that far. I don't think at any given point Overlord are really gonna have a significant advantage, but sometimes you don't need to. Sometimes you just need to feel confident on your heroes. And. Play them with high skill. Though, like I said before, I don't think Void is the most Overlord hero. If it were up to me, I'd just say, okay, screw it. Overlord, don't pick what's meta. Pick, what, uh, pick your favorite heroes. Pick some of those squishy ranged carries or Illu heroes or... Do they still run Naga? I'm not sure. It's been a while, but I do remember a really good Naga game from... Overlord swell. Down goes the Mars. As yeah. Simply too much they can throw at him. Guo Guo does go down once again. As four people are looking for a free kill top. Chronosphere is available, meaning they can fight into anything. Slark smoked up. There is a Marcy leading the charge in front of him, but I think the plan is to rebound, and then, oh, oh, that is gonna hurt, Slark with double damage, in comes the Chrono Sphere, what, no, it was in the Chrono by one freaking millimeter and Void dies because of it, that's gotta hurt, oh my god, I was like, ah, why is it not attacking, but one millimeter of the base was in the Chrono Sphere, and I think they're so freaking tilted about that, because that would have been the perfect team wipe they've been looking for. Then again, it's not like an, even a single time gorillas have fought together. They just don't feel the need to do so, or... Well, they maybe the need, but... You know, there is objectives to be had on this map that you also kind of want to get. Now OD gets stun locked up. And that's a full team wipe. So, once again, Overlord doing a lot better than I anticipated from the draft. I think a large deal is that with both the Mars and the Primal Beast, they just feel confident. They feel in their lane. Two things Overlord I know for a fact really like are high strength beefy heroes and the ability to go in all at once. Like Tidehunter, that's the peak Overlord hero. Sadly, it's also crap nowadays. Dogcrest, he goes down and Snark 
Do you want a 1v3 here? Apparently he does. Underlord. He has the Aghanims already, which means he can do the boss fight from the freaking Aghanims Labyrinth. And Slark, yeah, I don't know why he tried to win before there. I think Gorilla are like, okay, we don't really have a way of losing this game. Let's just have fun. Chen now wants new creeps, but he cannot be here. He needs to be very careful. He needs to wait for his team to respawn. They need to regroup instead of splitting up. Look, once again, they're splitting up. Okay, OD, he can solo kill Judy. That's fine. That's fine, but... Viper going mid, that seems risky. At best, and fighting when the Slark is not available also does. Doing a good amount of damage to the Void, though. Viper is one of his hardest counters. Mars, ooh, saving Void's life. Now, can Viper hold his own here from the looks of it? Yes, so far at least. Which Doctor comes in with an ultimate. One that OD is too impressed by, but that second Voodoo, ward sw voodoo switch through. That is gonna do the trick. And people have got to run for their lives. It's a hundred damage per projectile. That's really not bad considering how annoying they are to dodge and how many of them you can spam. Down goes Marcy and are, are you telling me Gorilla are just throwing this? Because they aren't taking this game seriously in the slightest. They're 4k behind, but you see what the Viper does, right? Viper can stand still and he could 1v3, so now he can still 1v2 or at least hold his own really well against the Void in a 1v1, which is good enough. But why are they not fighting as a group? I do not get it. Gorilla, please play serious. I get it's the round robin. I get you're not scared of Overlord, but you should be. Void is one of those heroes, well, I don't think it's a good white game, and I think he's counted, I've said all that before. You know my thoughts on the draft and on the game right now. That doesn't mean that they can't end if they just keep winning fight after fight. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The second OD and Slark are together, they just delete the Void. Everybody else has to flee. And okay, cool, you get the Chen, but was that worth it, Mr. Primal Beast? Because now everybody is together instead of dying one by one. Okay, there's a pulverize on the OD. That is still gonna hurt. But Fonte also there. And you can kill either the OD or the Snark. That's my whole point. Gorilla know that, of course. They just didn't give a hoot. <laughs> Going for the full greed mode. Trying to, you know, get as many kills. Get maybe a Rampage to look good on their profile. And I understand. We've had teams lose games before because they literally just thought they had outdrafted hard enough not to take the game seriously. We've also had times where, you know, things went really, really wrong because of that. And then everybody cried throw and we had to conduct a very expensive and hard investigation to rule out them throwing when it was really just a team getting pretty confident. Because, yeah, we do take that sort of thing real freaking seriously in the Dota scene. And Chet is just a bunch of salty... I'm not gonna say the words. Grimstroke goes on down. See that little ink club there? That's what you... Uh, that, that's what the salty crying betters in Chet are. Viper? Tanking through it as in comes the Slark. And once again, the second they're together, none of them die instead of all of them one by one. They just needed to group up and Void goes on down. That is 70 seconds, no Void. With a Slark at your doorstep, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna freaking do? Boop, down goes Witch Doctor. And Slark decides it's for the better to get out right now, but only because OD didn't communicate a hey, let's go, go more. Okay, or maybe because of the buybacks. That also makes a lot of sense. Nice self save on the OD. Can he blink out after that? Nope, he cannot. Instead, he can get pulverized and smashed into the ground. And yeah. That, see, it's once again a miscommunication. Like, OD blinks in the second Slark jumps out. And they need to stop making those four pass. They could have just gone back 
like both the Slark and the OD, or the OD kills that go, go, go before Slark could have left. But this has always been a weakness for Gorilla. Yesterday they did the exact same thing a few times and lost the game because of that. So. Just please, Gorilla, don't make this game any longer than it needs to be. The other series was supposed to start, I think, half an hour ago. And they aren't playing fully seriously. Because obviously, when you teleport an OD bottom lane while everybody else is fighting in the triangle, you know they aren't playing seriously. If it was okay, they, like what happened just now, that's an accident. That happens to us all. That's my average pub game every day. But you do not teleport the OD for support when you see four people under ward. Now they do get the Roche out of that. And Overlord, can they make complete comeback of this Aegis? Someone in the chat says, I keep jinxing the teens and yeah, I just like the cast curse is real. I hope Gorilla just realize in time they have to play seriously. Because that little mistake there at the base, that's why I was so worried for them. They are a team that make a lot of mistakes. They're a great team in terms of individual talent. I also like their drafts. I mean, this OD, it's still what's keeping their draft together, right? It's still doing so much freaking work. He's done a ton of damage. He's got great ult. Boom. But mistakes happen. And one too many mistakes against the Void Draft. Like, now getting getting Foreman Chronot right now, that was straight up lose the game. And instead, though, they will kill the Void to prevent the Chronos here from coming out at all. Will not quite get him. Just get the Witch Doctor, and that is two main Chrono. OD gets saved by the Spare, though. Oh my goodness. And Marcy trying to run down the Grimstroke. Doctress, he is not going to be able to. He is just going to die. They did get the Void, and that was their objective. They did survive the Chronosphere. Most importantly, the OD survived the Chronosphere. But I can notice these teams are getting tired. They are just making a lot of these really awkward mistakes. I Grimstroke has finally been taken off the map. And once again, all the kills happen where I don't look. Viper getting pulverized into the ground. Does he care? Nope, not in the slightest. He's a freaking Viper. The break, though, that he really minds. And that break plus the BKB means Primal Beast is going to turn that fight around. Gorilla. Oh my god, they're playing so sloppy right now. This is actually almost triggering me. And if somebody calls me out for flaming them, I don't care. They are playing sloppy. I've seen enough Gorilla games to know when they're being sloppy. Like, holy shit. Please group up, guys. Go for a smoke. Just anyone smoke. Even if you catch the freaking, I don't know, the Witch Doctor, the Grimstroke. Well, Chen needs new Kreeze first. That's another thing, though. That's another reason why they're so split all the time. Chen has to constantly freaking get his creeps. And I think there you also really notice the communication issue. That some teams have, other teams don't. When you have, like, a, Ch a Chen that needs to get his creep army, and people just assume Chen can be there for a team fight and end up fighting 4v5, or technically 4v5 because Chen didn't have to creep for one of these fights, Okay, Dockrest setting up a rebound off the Chen Creeps, and that will be a follow-up kill on the Mars, I think. Yep, he even dropped the Arena, which is only worse. Mars' BKB wears out just at the awkward timing. She will kill off the Sand Tower, but gets pulverized into the ground herself. 110 seconds, no Mars. But, man, this game is such a back and forth when it shouldn't be, and it doesn't need to be. But Overlord are a talented team. I gotta give them that. Individual skill is pretty good for them. When they do not miscommunicate. OD, he dumps on Django. But that one spear where he thought he could pin somebody to the trees here. And those trees were exactly the ones that were being broken. That really just cost Overlord their comeback. You're, they were supposed to punish Gorilla for playing sloppy and not really taking things too seriously. Maybe they're just tired. I'm not sure. Maybe if they played like 
three series or, so, or a best of three series and another best of one or something like that before then, then I apologize. That happens to the best of them. And would also explain why they're, play why they're playing a little bit sloppy. Slark gets caught, but they do not mind. They would have put him there if he couldn't take the Chronosphere. See, and that's what I mean. Gorilla are a really good team when it comes to calculating stuff like this. And there's the follow-up. Everything is all right. Ponte is gonna go for that kill. Well, for me, not everything is all right, because I was kind of hoping for the comeback. But that one spear just kind of... I don't think that one spear was everything that it, you know, that made the difference here. It was supposed to be a really easy win for Gorilla. I think Gorilla still see it as an easy win too, knowing them. They're just like, oh yeah, easy game, fun game, not to worry. Well, better end before, you know, more people respawn and things are actually going to get hard. Yeah, that is GG. Gorilla, they outdrafted. They had it from the beginning, except that they played really sloppy. And they even played sloppy for their standard. Oh, what a game! That took way longer than it had to. But it was entertaining for the most part, except for the last 10 minutes or so. Those really triggered me. Okay, maybe the server was lagging actually, because I got a match sign out delay. So, game coordinator is being dumb, and if everybody played with 250 ping, that would also explain. You know, Slark jumping in, uh, no, Slark jumping out, the second OG jumps in. Because stuff like that is not something that Gorilla usually do and aren't supposed to do. But hey, it was still a very nice game, all things considered. It was super chaotic, a nice back and forth. I do like when the matchups are kind of balanced like that. And I think if they hadn't... If they, just imagine if the OD was banned, right? Because that OD last pick, it's what pulled this Gorilla Draft together. It's what made it work so freaking well. And... Yeah, when they had the OD, they were just like, Hey, hey, we got a lead, guys. We were not even supposed to have a lead until 25 minutes. Let's just have some fun. Let's just have our sc uh, Slark scale up. Holy crap, that was a pain to watch, though. <laughs> Those last 10 minutes, other than the big team fight. And when everybody started th taking the game seriously again, the team fight suddenly started being good too. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we got one last series where I am sure both parties will take the game a lot more seriously and will play properly. I don't think there's going to be any major outdrafts like this happening again. Where you accidentally let an OD through in a game where OD ends up being the most important player, in my opinion. Just because he saved the Slark like three or four times during the Chronosphere, right? And killing off the Slark is the only way to win against that hero if you can, like, either one-man Chrono him or... I don't know, Stunlock nuke him before he gets the ultimate off with some kind of hero combo. So yeah, see you ladies and gentlemen in just a second. Final best of two of the day coming your way. I am looking forward to it.
203X. You are now clear for docking. Have a nice stay here in Drexia. I'm Drexia Cruiser Controller X205. If you have any problems, let me know. Bubble Control 1 out.
Gorilla, they just decide to farm for longer than they really should. Oftentimes when they feel like they have an outdraft or when they have the late game advantage. Radiant team back. They have lost a bunch of games due to it. And I am happy we get to see a very different approach to Dota. As these are two teams both known for their wacky drafts and both known for kind of being super hit or miss too, right? Fire team ban. Like Kobolds, they get a lot of shit for the way they draft. And then when it works out, everybody cries and everybody is like, how did they do that? How is their draft working out? When in reality, I think their drafter is one of the most talented ones. And it's just the team Ten communication seconds. and stuff like that that's lacking. I think if you put Kobolds into a boot camp for like a month, like a, v a really freaking intensive boot camp, right? Help! I'm not sure what country they're from. If it's country of military service, because that's the thing, right? A lot of Dota play, a lot of Dota players have to do mandatory conscription and stuff. Just imagine if they could sign up together for boot camp and get yelled at as a team of five, as a freaking squadron, to do some team building. The military should offer that. Like, if there's already Dota teams and they have to take a break anyhow, if you lose your team captain because he has to do a year of military service, then. Just take the entire team. See it as a team building exercise. Ten seconds. Military gets more people. They get better team play, right? Because seriously, I think Five that's what Kobolds need. Minutes. They need someone to yell at them like, you just uh, you just teleported top. Announce to your team that you teleported top. You did announce the 10 push-ups. I think that would help them so much. That's really what's wrong with Kobolds a lot of the time. Up against Yangon Galacticos. And Yangon Galacticos... I mean, the Jaro got the second pick. I think that says it all. If it doesn't, then you're about to see what I mean. But Yangon, they're a super strong team. Who usually go for pretty meta drafts. And then one or two really weird heroes. I'm not even sure if this Jaro Cup to support or carry. Or how are they going to play this. Because, yeah. Yangon, they don't go for completely wacky drafts. Five put together remaining. out of... I mean, this isn't wacky for Cobalt standards. Shadow Shaman, Dawnbreaker, plus a Mars, that makes sense. They got a lot of beefcakes. Yangon, I just want them to reveal is it support or a core? That still doesn't answer my question. Great. Like Yangon, they really love flexing heroes. They really love flex picking heroes and switching it up with the last pick. And. They also, you know, generally they are pretty consistent. Monkey King. I'd say, unlike Kobolds, they're definitely not lacking communication skill. I think that's really Kobolds' only weakness. Why they get so much crap. Because, yeah, a lot of the times you can kind of see their team. Ten One person remaining. teleports. And is it tech, let's say, under the top tower, right? My previous Five example. And then you see everybody else teleport just like three, five, seven seconds later, and it's too late because he didn't go like, hey, guys, let's dev top. Are you porting with me? Stuff like that. It's really important. Though, Radiant Monkey King picked up into the Mars. That's something Kobolds aren't happy about. I'm sure about that. Uh, plus one Monkey King? Support Earthshaker. That much is certain. No, well, Monkey King isn't certain. But it's the most likely. Ten seconds remaining. Five seconds Yangon, remaining. they can flex the Rubik mid. He can be Dyer a support. Gyrocopter can be a support. Gyrocopter can be a mid. Gyrocopter can be a one. And the Monkey King can be a mid. This is why I think they are really, really strong as a team. Just because they always draft... Well, not usually something like this. Usually it's more like pick two meta heroes, then pick remaining. two meta heroes you can flex, and then see what the enemy's last Five pick is. That's remaining. how I would usually describe a Yang on draft. This time around, they're picking a few more flex heroes, though maybe they don't have the intent of flexing all of them.
Radiant team back. All right, I am not okay. Okay, see, Lone Druid being banned here. That's why I love Kobold so much. But usually, they are also the type of team that if you just kind of destroy them. Ten seconds remaining. Five seconds remaining. Like, they're not a good comeback team. I don't know. Both of these teams have casted a lot. I know they're ins and outs. But with the new patch and this many potential flex pick from Yangon, I'm not going to try to predict any fancy last picks here. Okay, well, maybe Cobalt. Cobalt's very last pick, depending on what gets. Oh. Um. What about Phantom Lancer? Luna or Phantom Lancer? Ten seconds remaining. Luna for the AoE clear against the Nature's Prophet Five and for being able remaining. to deal with the Monkey King because Monkey King, he wants to ult you when nothing is around, right? And when nothing is around, Luna can press ultimate. So that would work. Plus, decent synergy with this. But I still like the idea of a Phantom Lancer, because you got the Shadow Shaman to hold somebody down while he's being killed by the army of Phantoms. You got an arena where Phantom Lancer is also really, really strong. You got a Dawnbreaker. Everything here prevents the Phantom Lancer from getting kited around, other than like the Viper. And the PL is an excellent hero to protect the Viper, to stand in front of that poisonous flying thing. Kobolds, what's it gonna be? I bet it's gonna be maybe PA, that's another one. I think PL would be probably the best in terms of what's meta. Maybe Urza? Like a... Choose your hero. Uh, I should not have used the word meta, should I? I think Kobolds can hear me or something. And they just go like meta? No, 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 we don't do that here. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We just end this fast. They have an Age's Prophet. We'll pick some push and Oh man. Last best of two series of the day. I don't know what to make of this. I know that Scotty's the core player, so it's a core Viper. But I know that Scotty plays a really sick PL. That's why I was like, PL, PL, PL. It's. Yeah. 10 seconds remaining. Five seconds remaining. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the show, guys. I am not going to try to analyze two teams who refuse any knowledge of the meta. That's commonly popular. And the worst part is, I hyped this series from the start of the day because I knew the draft was going to be wacky. But did any of you expect it to be this wacky? Because other than the young PH Monkey King, and, well, the Shadow Shaman for Kobolds, those two I could have maybe predicted. Those two I could have probably predicted. AT Earthshaker? Okay, that's another relatively normal one. The rest is not. Gilday, I know he loves this. I know he loves this Rubik though. I know he freaking loves this Rubik more than anything and can make some really sick plays happen with that. There may be many Earths, 
but there was only one. Oh, fun! And a pause right off the bat. That was a morning. Oh, I'm looking forward to this now. These drafts got me hyped. I freaking love both these teams for the way they draft, for the way they pick. It is just a support gyrocopter. At least that's relatively mainstream. But, you know, skill A Rubik with an AT Earthshaker. That's gonna be sick. That's gonna be such a sick top lane if they lane together. You can lift into Fissure every time. Then again, Kobolds, they do like to end their games quickly. They're a big fan of ending around the 25 to 35 minute mark. And, well, the Lycan allows for that. I'm not sure Lycan is the greatest hero against Nate's Prophet. Like, one of the two things that my makes Lycan really strong is his push. And the other is his early game, Tyree. Thirty seconds to battle. And Marvel will be playing the Monkey King mid lane for those curious. So having the option of flexing multiple hero and mo heroes and multiple roles does make it harder for Kobold oh, to <laughs> draft oh, against already. what Yangon are putting together here. The battle begins. And a nice bounty rune being denied with both wolves at the same time, so it says two bounty runes being denied. Viper, however, oh, yeah, he got missile plus lifted, or no, missile plus fate bolt spammed. Not the way you want that wa that lane to go, but it is technically a try lane. I don't think they're gonna try lane this long term, but Nature's Prophet, he can handle being a position one safe laner. And AT, he is a carry Earthshaker, right? Or at least semi carry. But we can expect him to go for that against, we can expect him to go for those enchant totem kills. Nice stun on the Dawnbreak, bullying her away, but there isn't really kill potential. Oh, I feel better already. Looking at the Nature Prophet, he has an easy time. And the Shadow Shaman is just chilling around the mid lane, hoping Monkey King is dumb enough to walk up this high ground. And he will indeed. Monkey King completely fine though, as he is just a monkey. And provided he gets his Jingu to proc, he can live still back to full anywho. Over on top lane, Dawnbreaker almost gonna go down, but okay, this time I'm gonna make sure she really gets away. Because last time with the first blood Viper, I also thought Viper was just gonna walk, and then freaking Fate Bolt co came out. Freaking missile over bajillion range too. And will this one be enough? Yep, from the looks of it, clearly. <laughs> Monkey King not exactly enjoying having to play against two heroes. He's being zoned out of lane completely by Shadow Shaman. Yowch, that's one way to punish a try lane, I gotta say. So now it's duo lane versus duo lane instead. Just trying to secure their mid lane is the respective best farm. You're not getting what you came for. So far so good. I mean, this creep hero versus creep hero off lane should be favoring Nature's Prophet for quite a while. Like I said, I'm not sure how great 
like in matches up against the Nature Prophet once he gets the Helm of the Overlord, once he actually starts running at you with some hasted Ancient Creeps. But until then, Nature's Prophet definitely got the edge. It was considered a 50 50 matchup back before Nature's Prophet got nerfed. Like, when his shard still did those really powerful big tree ins. Back then, you considered the matchups just super 50 50, and we would see that a lot more often. But since this Lycan trope was picked into the Nature's Prophet, I think Kobolds need to have some kind of plan with it that isn't just, hey guys, we got a Lycan trope and that's gonna push and end the game too early for the enemy to come online. Because yeah, that is a lot of times how you play the game. When you do go for a Lycan draft. And you can't rely on his pushing aspect. So... Or it's gonna be a full hard carry Lycan. I would like it. Like, hard carry as in... After his Helm of the Overlord, he just gets right-click items. A Bashy Boy, maybe a Desolate or something along those lines, or an Assault Curse. Just make you good at running people down in the Wolf form, then get Wolf Bite, and have both of them run at somebody. Okay. Dawnbreaker is gonna spin on AT. Hammer plus spin. Man, always look at the freaking lowest health at the map. Uh-oh. And down goes Nate's Prophet next. At least that one.